sure you don't want to do this? No, I'm, I'm leaving. When we're All right. Ready, Aaron? Yes, please. Okay, so we're at the meeting for the July 14th Planning Commission, and we are going to do um, roll call. McElroy? Here. Millie? Here. Commissioner Ali is absent. Diaz? Here. Whitlatch? Here. Pearson? Here. Aguilar? Here. Okay, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It would have been the same if it wasn't you, Maria. <laughs> At the, we're going to public comment. At this time, members of the public may comment on any item not appearing on the agenda. If you wish to participate in today's public comment via telephone, please call 559-624-7013. You will be connected to the boardroom to address the Planning Commission in the same manner as if you were here in person. Please state your name and address for the record in order to be heard by everyone in the room. Your statements will go out on a live audio stream and will be included in the audio recording of the meeting. This meeting can be viewed at the Planning Commission's Meetings Tulare County main page website. Under state law, matters presented under this item cannot be discussed or acted upon by the Planning Commission at this time. For items appearing on the agenda, the public will be invited to make comments at the time the item comes up for Planning Commission consideration. So that all interested parties have an opportunity to speak, any person addressing the Planning Commission may be limited at the discretion of the chair. And that's me. Um, now we move on to approval of minutes. Um, I have one change that I noted, and that is that uh, Commissioner Pearson, so Vice Chair Pearson, opened the meeting, as opposed to me opening it. What was that? Commissioner Pearson opened the meeting. Opened the meeting? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Are there any other changes? Public comment, did I fall asleep? Oh, I blew right by that. <laughs> uh, sorry, yes, you're right, thank you. Um, so backtracking on that, um, public comment, is there anybody who would like to comment on a non-agendized item? Cliff is smiling, gotcha. Is there anybody on the phone? No, we have nobody on the phone. Okay, so nobody in the audience? Good, Bill? Yeah, that's good. All right. So, no, <laughs> you might have been. Um, okay, so um, we're going to close public comment and move on to approval of the minutes um, with the chain, one change that I mentioned at least. Are there any other changes needed for the minutes? I'll make a motion we approve June 23rd, 2021 minutes. With one correction that uh, Maria didn't open the meeting, Steve did. So. That's what I said. I know, I'm just restating it. Okay. That's, a, that's uh, I moved that. Okay. Bill Whitlatch moved. Moved by Commissioner Whitlatch, seconded by Steve Pearson. Please vote. Okay, the motion to approve minutes passes with five yes, zero no, one abstention, and one absence. Okay, uh, now we move on to the consent calendar. There are two items on that. Action on all items in this section will be taken with one motion and vote, unless anyone wishing to discuss any one of these items requested to be pulled from the consent calendar and held over for such discussion. The consent calendar is an untimed item and may be taken up at any time during the course of today's meeting as time allows. We're going to go ahead and do that now. Um, one item is extension of time EOT 21-004 for PSP 18-003. And the second is extension of time EOT 21-005 for PSP 19-003. Is... Um, We'll open um, public comment on these items. There's one opportunity to comment. Is there any comments by anybody present or on the phone for this item or these items? What's up? 
No comments from the phone. Okay, nobody present? All right. All right. So then um, we move on to um, Have approval. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. We move on to approval, to voting or discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any discussion on these items? I'll make a motion that uh, we approve a two-year extension of the time of, to September 12, 2023, for special use permit PSP 18-003. No, it's. Yes, one vote. Just remove. Oh, I make that motion to approve the consent calendar A and B. Okay. Is there a second? Okay, motion was made by Commissioner Whitlatch and seconded by Commissioner Millies to approve the two items on the consent calendar. Um, please vote. Motion to approve uh, the items on the consent calendar passes with six yes, zero no, zero abstentions, and one absence. Um, okay, we move on to parcel map public hearings. Action on all parcel maps in this section of the agenda will be heard in one public hearing unless anyone wishing to discuss any one of these items requested it be pulled for a separate public hearing. No staff presentation will be given on any item unless requested. In any case, there will be a separate vote on these items. Um, to members of the public, if you wish to participate in today's public hearing via telephone, please call 559-624-7013. You will be connected to the boardroom to address the Planning Commission in the same manner as if you were here in person. If you choose not to call in, you may also participate by submitting an email as this item is being heard. Email should include the sender's name and address for the record. Email should also include the following in the subject, agenda item number and then the number. And there's only one item, which is item A, um, and can be sent to the clerk of the Planning Commission at Planning Commission, and that's all one word, Planning Commission at TulareCounty.ca.gov. Every effort will be made to read your comment into the record, but some comments may not be read due to time limitations. Comments received after the public hearing has closed will be made part of the record if received before the end of the meeting. That concludes the instructions for today's public hearing. Okay, so we have item A, which is a tentative parcel map number PPM 21-031. I will open for public comment. Is there anybody present who would like to comment on this item? Uh, Item to you, and if there is somebody out in the audience who'd like to to comment on it as well, we're looking forward to, to hearing about this project. Okay. So, staff presentation is is necessary. I don't think. Okay. Will April be presenting the comments? Yeah, she, she'll just uh, quickly go go over the comments. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. My name is April Hill, Project Planner Three at Tulare County Resource Management Agency. Uh, Sequoia River Lodge, River Lodge LLC asks to divide a vacant 5.48 acre parcel into two parcels. We did receive comments from one person who emailed to ask about future development and questioned a septic system near the river. Um, there is the, uh, the parcel and the two resulting parcels will part be partial, one of the parcels will be partially be in the F1 zone but there is sufficient land outside that to be uh, to develop to develop. Ms. Lucero, uh, I mean Mr. Hector Guerra uh, responded that uh, a cumulative analysis is based on at the time of application. Nothing is proposed at this time. No development is proposed. It would be speculative to guess what eventually would ever come in. And last, and even though it's in a flood zone, the project can be developed if it meets certain construction requirement or criteria. Do you have any questions for me or for? The access to the river, is there like a place to park or? 
The access is going to be from uh, from the Caltrans, and it's going to be up and around to get there. And there's existing easements to the north and to the east. So is that wide spot in the road where you can get adequate number of cars? But, you know, that if you ever drive up there, people are going down to the river, it's kind of crazy, so. Yeah, drove up there a few weeks ago and looked at it. There's, an, there's space. Okay. April, in here the, in the comments, it says that this is, uh, to quote, merely a division of land and would be speculative to guess what may eventually, if ever, go in. So is it just the land division at the moment? Yes. Okay, so down the road, if we wanted to be consistent with other projects that are near waterways, we would have to then look at the sewage and flow and topography and all that, but at this point, it's just land. Yes. Okay. All right, that's my question. It's a good one. Thanks. I was thinking about that. Good. Great minds. Thank you. You're welcome. Large heads. <laughs> All right. Any other questions or comments for uh, April? Steve? Okay. You done? The public speech. Public? Uh, me okay, yeah, we're getting there. Any other members of the public who would like to comment on this item? Okay, please come up and state your name and address for the record. Here's fine. Yeah. Hi. next door to the uh, property you're uh, discussing. Okay. Uh, I just received, you know, notice in the mail. Doesn't really say much. Just, you know, it's kind of Greek to me. But uh, my main uh, concern is septic. Uh, across the road, they put in the comfort suites. They've redone the uh, septic there three times, and that's across the highway. And I don't understand why, you know, they're considering building a, you know, lodge on that side of the road when they already have turned down another person that wanted to put in because of the septic danger. Bill, Bill we're just here to approve the division of land. This doesn't give them the right to build anything. Oh, okay. So, um, so there'll be, there will probably have to be, and I'm saying probably because there should be, another hearing when it comes time to decide on the building. And at that point, we can ask lots of questions about septic and location and placing and, and bilge pumps or whatever is necessary to go along with that. Um, if they don't meet the requirements at that time, then we have a certain decision to make. And if they do, then we have a, another decision. They want to divide the property. What is it, two different owners or what? I don't understand people why. People divide their own property. Who knows why? But do you notice, is there a lot of people that access the river that way? No, actually, it's pretty nice back there, except for the uh, rafters and oh, so okay. forth. Uh, but they, they don't have any right to do anything other than that they'll own two separate parcels, two tax bills. Okay. I'll come next time, I guess. Okay. Thank you. No matter what, you'll be notified, okay? okay? Is there anybody else in the audience who would like to comment or ask questions? Anybody on the phone? No, we have nobody on the phone. Okay, we'll give it the minute. Through the chair, the, the zone does allow development by right. Yeah. So can you explain that, April, for people who might want to know what that means? The ozone allows by right motels, grocery stores, restaurants, and, any, uh, and restaurants. The CR land use designation um, establishes commercial uses uh, geared towards tourists and other visitors, such as dining and motels and spas, et cetera. Okay, so then my question on that would be, then this is the hearing. There's no further hearing for in order for them to build? This is a land division. Okay. Presumably, they'll sell it to different, to different people. And then... You can't build without... But building by right means, they, yes, building permits. But they still have to meet septic system requirements. Building permits, Water consult quality. with environmental health, uh, 
in this case, they'll be have to consult with the with Caltrans. And, and uh, through the chair, um, when they tr previously went forward a little ways with the mm -hmm. hotel at this location, uh, they were going to go to a public hearing through CEQA anyway, regardless. Um, so I, th it, it is true that they would have, and, and same with the hotel that the board just recently approved. There are by right projects, but uh, given the sensitive nature of the projects in this area, mm. uh, we tend to uh, um, look at them very closely under CEQA. So again, this is the land division for that purpose, but if they were to move forward with the uh, building permits, uh, there would be uh, much more CEQA involved. Uh, given the sensitive nature of these sites. Yeah, that's what I wanted to make. But what you said previously was true. It won't necessarily be on the zoning or the land yeah. use side. It'll be on the, the CEQA side. Okay, as I wanted to make sure of, because Mr. Oliver and maybe other people would probably want to have some input on that. I, yeah, I, I have no doubt. Okay, so there will be another hearing then? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, um, is there any other, are there any other questions for April? Or anybody else in the audience who would like to speak? And nobody on the phone, Vilma? No, we have nobody on and the We're phone. well past that minute, so we're gonna go ahead and close public comment on this item. And um, is there any commissioner discussion? Any motion? Buttons up so we can electronically complete. <laughs> I'm opening it. There you go. All right. You want a motion? If you want to make a motion, sure. Uh, Wayne Millies. I'll make a motion to approve a categorical exemption consistent with the California Environmental Quality Act CEQA and the state CEQA guidelines pursuant to Title 14 Cal Code Regulation section 15303 pertaining to new construction or replacement of small structures and conditionally approved tentative parcel map number PPM 21-031 with a final map required. Gil Aguilar, I'll second that motion. Please vote. Motion to approve tentative parcel map number PPM 21-031 passes a six yes, zero no, zero abstentions and one absence. Okay, we move on to the public hearing, section six. Um, to members of the public, if you wish to participate in today's public hearing via telephone, please call 559-624-7013. You will be connected to the boardroom to address the planning commission in the same manner as if you were here in person. Please state your name and address for the record in order to be heard by everyone in the room. Mm -hmm. Your statements will go out on the live audio stream and will be included in the audio recording of the meeting. The timer will be set to three minutes, so please adhere to the time limit. If you choose not to call in, you may also participate by submitting an email as this item is being heard. Email should include the sender's name and address for the record. Email should include the following in the subject, agenda item number and the item number, and can be sent to the clerk of the planning commission at Planning Commission at TulareCounty.ca.gov. Every effort will be made to read your comment into the record, but some comments may not be read due to time limitations. Comments received after the public hearing has closed will be made part of the record if received before the end of the meeting. That concludes the instructions for today's public hearing. We have several items uh, for hearing. Each one's going to be heard individually. Uh, the first item is item A, special use permit number PSP 18-100, and um, is that you? Yeah. All right. Uh, we're going to open uh, the public comment with the staff presentation. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. My name is April Hill, Project Planner 3, Tulare County Resource Management Agency. Mr. Mamalejo requests approval of a special use permit, number PSP 18100, to allow a third residence on the two acre portion of a 5.79 acre parcel that's located in the AE20 zone and the northwest corner of Avenue 428 and Road 144 east of Arosi. Agent is Frank Gomez. And the application was submitted in response to a code compliance violation 
There were formerly five employee housing residences. Two were removed this year, allowing the project to move forward to <coughs> a Planning Commission public hearing. Approval of the, sub, of the special use permit and compliance with contingency of approval will resolve the code violation. Here's the hearing notification map. Project was noticed according to the law with a 10 day comment period. Staff received no comments. Septic site is located outside any urban boundaries is subject to the Royal Valley Lands Plan. County Public Works Engineering Branch requires dedication of additional right of way and the construction of drive approaches. Site is zone AE20, which allows one single family residence or mobile home on the property. One additional residence allowed for each 20 acres. Because the parcel existed before zoning was applied in 1978, the second residence is allowed by right. <coughs> residence required requires an approved special use permit. The aerial shows the subject site and surroundings, which contain orchards and scattered rural residences. Here's the site plan showing the mobile homes that were removed and the residences that will stay. Environmental Health Services requires certification of the existing septic system. Unused uh, septic system shall be abandoned. The applicant shall remain for a bacterial water analysis. Site contains a water storage tank for fire suppression. Fire department requires access, fire extinguishers, uh, smoke and fire, carbon monoxide detectors, and posted address numbers. This project will not have a significant effect on the environment, has been determined to be categorically exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act and consistent with state CEQA guidelines. Per Section 15301, existing facilities, and Section 15303, new construction or conversion of small structures. No additional construction is proposed. Subject site is not located in an environmentally sensitive area surrounded by agricultural and rural residential uses. Project will not result in significant impacts, will not require additional public services, and conditions of approval are included. That in staff's report, the agent um, uh, informed me yesterday he will not be attending, not able to attend. April, I have a question before you start. Uh, it shows a uh, possible irrigation district. Was that a, originally a, a part of the original natural flow? Is that a, considered a stream or a river? If it ended up being straight, it's irrigation ditch, usually. So. Okay. From what I understand on your presentation here, there were actually four, four residences on this. Five. Yes. Or actually five. Okay. Yeah. They got rid of two. And they're allowed two. They were allowed two by right. This this use permit will allow them the third. Okay. And, and the other two. The other two offending are gone. Okay. Yeah. Right. That. It it took a while getting through HCD. <laughs> All right. Continuing to be for employee housing? No, they were. Their employee housing permit was revoked. So. And there's no way for us to know if they're actually using it for employee or for family. Is there? So Frank's here, Gomez, the agent. Okay. Yeah, be here. Be here. No. Co code compliance department is monitors them. They've had a. They have a record. When, when, once you're an offender, they watch you closer. Good thing I'm not there. All right. Um, are there any other questions for April? No. Yeah. Be for family, though, right? Yeah. Okay. Choirs, family, or people who work on the site. People who work on the site, so employees. Yes, but not the employee program, not the state employee program. What's the difference? Uh, through the chair, the difference is if they're in the employee program, that's actually, we oversee that, but th most agencies uh, have that through the state, through HCD, so it's a separate program. Mm -hmm. um, and here, we're, we allow uh, employees to stay on the site, much like family members for the third resident. So it's, it's technically not employee housing under any title or anything else like that, but we do allow it for a third resident. I'm just looking at 
the clarification, Erin, because I know that on every other project where a third or second or whatever extra residence comes up, we are always asking, is this going to be family only? So I wonder what the difference is if this is potentially employee housing versus if it's family housing. Uh, right. And, you know, <clears throat> the distinction under our zoning is um, <clears throat> uh, so a little bit questionable to make it only for family. Yeah. But um, we do have a condition, and we, we've done this pretty consistently, and it's a little unfair to take somebody out of the family or out of the employee housing program mm -hmm. and then say you have too many units now because we allow uh, multiple units under employee housing and then cut them down to three. So the, the trade-off is a little bit here that, uh, that we allow it for employees and have by practice allowed it for employees when they, they do come out of the employee housing program. Um, but our, our zoning does uh, say uh, relatives. But Condition 29, I think, restricts it to a very high degree. And um, I, I, in conversations with Frank, I, April nor I can say with certainty, but in conversations with Frank on this project, it was for family. So that, that's what we have, uh, at least out of the agents, uh, from the agent's perspective. So they're not going to be able to turn it into a general rental for Generally, they have not. I, I'm just saying, historically, when we've done use permits for third residents for projects coming out of the employee housing program, we've given them a little bit of a break by practice. And this, and I just wanted to put that in the record in case we get another case like this that we're not pointing and saying you have to have a relative here because by practice we've allowed it for uh, employees that are still on this site. And I was just looking at the consistency aspect to know where to go with that. Yeah. Right, and I, I want to try to be consistent. Too. Um, again, you get some of these uh, employee housing pro programs where there's 11, 11 units on the site, and even with the densities and everything else, it's really hard. You know, a lot of them have to come off off the site. So. Okay. Are there any other questions for staff? Okay. Is there anybody in the audience who would like to comment on this item? Anybody on the phone, Vilma? No. We'll yeah, give them the minute. I, I love those baby sounds, so that baby can say whatever she wants. It's a happy baby. Oh, in the back? Yeah. He's speaking to you, Bill. I don't know. I got nine grandchildren. I like every one of them, except maybe the oldest. <laughs> Nobody on the phone? No, we have nobody on the phone. All right. Um, so we are going to go ahead and close the public comment on this item and look for commissioner discussion, if any. Any discussion on this item? Not for me. All right. Uh, is there somebody who would like to make a motion? Your turn, Steve. All right. <clears throat> I'd like to make it an approval for a categorical exemption with consistent with the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, and the state CEQA guidelines pursuant to Title 14, California Code Regulations, Section 15301, pertaining to an existing facilities, and Section 15303, pertaining to new construction or conversion of small structures in petitionally approved special use permit number PSC 18-100. Yeah, click a button. Click a button. The oh, motion button. Excuse me. Uh -huh. Ed Diaz will second. Okay. Please vote. Motion made by Commissioner Pearson, seconded by Commissioner Diaz, passes with six yes, zero no, zero abstentions, and one absence. Okay. We move on to item B, which is for zone change number PZC21-002, and the contact on this is also April Hill. We're going to open public comment with the staff presentation.
Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. April Hill, Tulare County Planning. Michael and Michelle Mashigian ask that the Planning Commission recommend that the Board approve a zone change from the AA40 exclusive agricultural 40 acre minimum to the C3 service commercial zone on a five acre parcel with plans to establish an RV truck and trailer storage facility with enclosed automobile storage. The site is located outside in the urban boundary, about three miles south of Visalia city limits on the west side of road 140 and south of road 260. Surrounding properties contain agriculture and scattered rural residences. This to the site is direct to county maintained road 140, the engineering department, environmental services division, fire department will require, will provide recommendations at the building permit stage. City of Visalia and Caltrans had no comment about the project, neither did the Farm Bureau. Project is consistent with relevant general plan policies. A rural valley lands plan parcel evaluation concluded that the parcel will receive 14 RVLB points which is in the gray area in which no clear cut decision is readily apparent. In such instances, the Planning Commission and Board of Supervisors shall make a decision based on the unique circumstances pertaining to the particular parcel of land, including factors not covered by this system. And a five acre parcel is considered too small to farm efficiently. One of the land use pol element policies for commercial storage facilities requires storage facilities be screened from view through landscape buffers. The uh, zone itself does not require that. The existing AE40 zone is an exclusive zone for intensive and extensive agriculture uses, does not permit an RV truck storage facility even with a use permit. The proposed C3 service commercial allows many warehouses and storage yards for commercial vehicles. The option is the less intense C2 general commercial zone, which allows by right an auto storage garage and furniture warehouse for storing personal household goods. Here are aerial photos of the subject site and surroundings, one for within 500 feet and one for within an hour, um, a mile and a half. The five acre parcel was legally created in 1976 before the AU40 zoning was applied. Orchards existed on the site until about 1994 and a house on the site was demolished in 2010. Here are Google Earth photos showing road 140, the septic site and surroundings. Here's the preliminary site plan for the development proposed following approval of the zone change for recreational vehicle, truck and trailer storage with enclosed automobile storage. Public notice for the project was published June 30th in the Foothill Sun Gazette, mailed to surrounding property owners within 300 feet. One neighboring property owner phone telephone to ask what applicants plan to develop. A second neighbor called this week with concerns. A summary of the project. change from AE40 to C3 zone. Project will not have a significant effect on the environment, has been determined to be categorically exempt from CEQA, consistent with the state CEQA guidelines, pursuant to section 15303, new construction or replacement of small structures. The basis for the exemption is that the ground on the site was previously disturbed by an orchard and residence. Subject is not located in an environmentally sensitive area, is surrounded by agriculture and rural residences, will not require additional public services, and must comply with state and local regulations. Recommendations from county agencies will apply at the building permit stage. This ends staff's report. Do you have any questions for me or for the applicant? Um, April, one question that immediately pops to mind and then I have a couple comments, but the question is, uh, I thought I heard you say that there were some concerns expressed by somebody. Just what, phoned in. What were those concerns? That uh, it, this five acre parcel is in the middle of uh, ag land. Okay, do we have a map of uh, any other commercial facilities in close proximity? No. So this would be a, a commercial island in the middle of Agland. 
Yeah. I have some other questions, but I'll let you all ask if you have any. Can I, can I speak? Sure. Um, just to the north, the city of Isaiah has a huge master plan for housing, a whole development. I don't know how close it is, but it's got to be pretty close. And then across the road, there's a church that the Planning Commission did not approve. It went, George Finney approved it. So I'm still irritated about that. But uh, all those churches can go in any zoning. Um, so h how close is it to the city's master plan development? Remember that, Wayne, the big development? Yeah. Huge. I'm not familiar with that project. Um, the city didn't comment, are you? And the city didn't comment, so I was no. No, no, there's no comment. I'm just saying, if that project happens, it would be appropriate to have self-storage. Multiple by. parcels, so it was going to be complicated yeah. to put that project together. The, 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 the Farm Bureau didn't comment, is that correct? The, the Farm Bureau didn't have any comments either. And where's the Quia Delta property? There's a piece that Quia Delta owns that they, they voiced that they might want to move their hospital there, but it's unpopular with the city of Isaiah. It's three miles southeast of Visalia City limits, so, okay. You, you don't know where that parcel is? No, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, April, if you could, uh, on the presentation, I think if you could put up page 36. I don't have the... Uh, the, the vicinity map, if okay. you could show the vicinity <coughs> map, April. Thank you. There you go, that one right there. Bill, if you look at that, there's... Uh, That shows, gives you an idea how far it is from, from anything, from the cities. I'm not familiar with that road, April. Um, how wide is it? How many lanes? That's Lover's Lane. Lover's Lane. Lover's Lane? Yeah, it is. I've never driven down that. Yeah, it's a it's big wide. thoroughfare. Yeah. Okay. So we're not facing the same issue as with that Road 64 one. Mm -hmm. Um I mean, if development is heading that way, that's one thing. But my that's my other right well, my other concern, and one of the questions I wanted to ask, is um, if we're changing it to C3, or, or the ask is to change it to C3, they have by right the right to do any number of other projects in there, correct? So they could put in a gas station and diesel stop and, and all of that. Uh, the, the answer to that question would be yes, and again, the way we contain it is through a developer agreement like we have done on other projects where we limit the, the zoning because we are not supposed to condition zoning uh, when it's a legislative act, but um, they can voluntarily agree to limit themselves to, to this to make it more uh, uh, feasible to, to approve the legislative act of uh, approving the C3. Okay. Is everything else around there farmed? Uh, if you, you go back to the aerial, um, you know, it's a lot of uh, scattered rural residential and um, the, this property hasn't been farmed for a while. So to, to answer your question, no, it's not. Uh, uh, with the small lots out there, um, not not all of it's farmed. Um, but yeah, there's uh, it, it uh, is all zoned AE40, so, um, so the, it's the, all ag. The AE40 went out the window a long time ago, even though it's all AE40. Uh, uh, if you you go further back, uh, it was probably a probably a lot of that A1 zoned, but then they put AE40 over everything, yeah. so. Uh, yeah, the A A E forty. Um, I, I should say the A A one zoning went out the window a long time ago. <laughs> a question: Where's Al E Cook in relationship to this? Which one? Al E Cook. I don't know close? off the top of it. Way farther south. Farther yeah. south. This yeah. is two sixty, so it can't be that much farther south. But anyway, it's on the other side, but it's south. On the up, yeah. 
through, through the chair, the, what the first comment was from L.A. Cook, and they are located on the east side. Oh, they're right there. 40. That's one of their properties. Okay. Yeah. And isn't there also a uh, place that sells rocks on the corner right there? <coughs> huh? With Madam Chair, I... That's on uh, what ends up being K Road, I think, uh, somewhere. On the uh, east side of uh, Lover's Lane. K Road's farther A little west. further back towards Caldwell. So it is pretty close, 272. Well, half a mile. Um, Avenue 266. Yeah. Uh, April, on the aerial there, um, is the applicant, does that applicant own the property just to the north that's developed? It looks like a home and the shop and stuff. Different, different person? No. Well, what's going to happen is the city of Isay has set the trend, even though they have no one has acquired all those parcels. That's a huge housing development. I forget how many houses. So this is not encouraging growth because the city is encouraging growth that way. So it's probably a service that will be in need. So if you look at my garage, I need storage. It's mostly vehicle storage, too, right? RV, yeah. RV and I believe the applicants are in the in the audience and can explain their plan. Okay. All right. Um, so, any other questions for April? Is there anybody in the audience who would like to comment on this item? If yes, please state your name and address for the record. You'll have um, three minutes. Come on. Talking about. Uh, come up here. If, if you're individual people and have different things to say, you would each have your time. If you're if you're um, all one entity, then you can have. It's up to you. Uh, my name is uh, Jesse Haro, Maria Haro. Uh, we live in I mean one three eight seven one Avenue two sixty. Okay. Uh, behind the property that we were talking about. Okay. And we're concerned the, uh, that this is going to create a lot of traffic uh, coming in and out, and it's going to create crime. And we do have children, grandchildren, that visit us regularly, and we're afraid that uh, something bad could happen back there. Where It's uh, a business, and it's going to be open during business hours. This is going to be directly in my backyard, directly in my backyard. Um, Your property is the one to the north, right? Correct. So if you see the map there, right where it, right behind it in the back, where the dry ditch is, that's where um, okay. our land is. That's our home there. Now, we don't have walnuts there at this point because of the water situation. We let it go. Mm -hmm. But we are planning on getting it back as soon as we get that well back up again. Um, go back to the farming part of the, the walnuts there. Well, probably um, whatever we can put back there. But um, those, those, those are major concerns for us to have a business that in the future we do not know what kind of business will be. They start off as a storage area, maybe later on it can be something else that can be impacted with their, um, our home being directly in the backyard. Are you okay with a storage area, but just not what the future potential uses could be, or? Not, not okay with this, or any kind of commercial. I'm okay, okay. with ag, <clears throat> want to keep it ag, but not okay with commercial. Um, something that can start up storage, later on it can lead to a gas station, later on it can re lead to a hotel, motel. Who knows what it would lead to the future at that point. Okay. I've been out there for 25 years, and suddenly I've been seeing the increase of crime increase um, in that area there, break-ins. A lot of people walking in with that. Yeah. Where the traffic's coming by, maybe because they, you know, maybe two miles away they put that port party um, 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 business there. Um, maybe there's other business popping up that nobody's aware of, but there is um, people just walk up um, and um, 
around, around that area there. But I am concerned of having any kind of business there in my backyard. Any questions for the Haro? No, I got it. <clears throat> All right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Is there anybody else who would like to speak on this item? Please state your name and address for the record. Yes, I'm Ernest Rule, 13908 Avenue 260. In Visalia. Okay. I live just to the north of that location there, about 600 feet, just 500 feet limit. Okay. I was never notified. I'm worried about the groundwater level in that area. I've had to deepen my well 150 foot in the last few years. Okay. And if somebody else comes in, the groundwater level for us, and that's my home, I've lived there for 45 years. The groundwater level is going to deplete. I'm not going to be able to live. If you want to kill me, put the people in there. <laughs> that's the way I feel about it. Right. And that's, I'd appreciate you to vote against it. Do you have any questions? Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Is there anybody else in the audience who would like to comment? Please state your name and address for the record. Crystal Smith, I live at 25957 Road 140. Can you speak more into the mic, please? Sure. Uh, 25957 Road 140, right next door. And I am Michelle Jump, and we live on the same property. Okay. I am so what's the, the baby's thing? <laughs> <laughs> so, now, we, my husband's family has lived out there since the 50s, forever. Mm -hmm. Um... Now, I know that the people that own it have been storing equipment there, uh, man lifts and that sort of stuff. But until they started doing that, we've never had anything stolen from that ranch. Um, what was it? Eight weeks ago, Maria? Approximately eight weeks ago, while I was out of town, she was out of town, my husband was at work. People got onto our ranch and destroyed my truck sold their suburban and a trailer and a ton of other stuff. And before that, a little bit before that, a, my husband's truck got stolen. Great. So we've never had a problem out there. For over 60 years, my husband's family originally owned that five acres, which was part of our, the land. And, and they sold it off. Right. And then that, he sold it um, so where the Harrows live, was also part of our ranch. So, my husband works for the sheriff's department. He has to work today, so I'm here. Um, he is adamantly hates the idea of more traffic, more people coming in and out, <laughs> you know, and especially if it's gonna be a 24 hour storage facility where anybody can go and get their stuff, which is, they have the right to, but our thing is, is to make sure that it is not gonna be where it's the traffic. Our biggest get closer to the mark. Our biggest thing is the traffic and making sure my daughter's room is right there at that property line. And the noise level already is bad enough because we have a lot of noise level. So if you add more and it's a truck and it's RV or whatever else, that's gonna be more noise. That's gonna wake her up in the middle of the night, especially, and for crime wise. We already, you know, starting to feel not safe because of our being broken into. So this criminal activity, though, it wasn't precipitated by the, the vacant lot. The, the, it, it could have been because there is ag equipment next door, but there isn't. There's no for sure. But having more traffic out there, it can create more. So are they already storing stuff on the site? Um, like ag equipment. Are the applicants here? Um, are the applicants here? Yeah, yes. Okay. Are. So are there any other questions for the present audience members commenting? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else in the audience who would like to comment, please state your name and address for the record. Uh, 
Mike, Michigan. Uh, my address is 674 Chevy Chase, uh, East Chevy Chase in Tulare. Okay. Then go ahead. Yeah, um, you can. You know, uh, um, I don't think any crime is, you know, directly related to me putting the, the equipment there. It, it's going up everywhere. We own some property down the street, uh, some almonds down the street, and we're getting broke into every couple weeks. There's some, you know, nothing crazy recently, but uh, there's just a lot of crime there. Um, we're, we're not going to do a gas station. I don't know if you can specify, you know, I, I know it's a commercial zone, so I don't know if you can say it, it, you can only do this with it, but I, I'm not going to put a gas station. We're just, just a mom and pop. <laughs> did, you, did you do market research to, to, to determine that this is a, uh, the storage business is a, will work there? You know, I, I've done my own market. It's not very scientific, but you know, just watching boats, RVs going down the street, um, the, the, it seems like the two cities are getting closer together. So, so it's a gut feel on your part. It's a gut feel, you know, to be to be honest. And uh, Lovers Lane is is a very busy. Uh, road. Um, I, I don't, I don't see it drawing any more traffic. I mean, maybe a little bit more. Someone's out of the area, but no, we're just we're thinking picking up the customers or or uh, people that are, that go that route anyway. Um, so, when you mentioned that you weren't sure if we could put some kind of limit on it, are you offering that as a possibility yeah. that you're open to? Yeah. I'm, okay. Yeah. I'm, All right. I could write, I'm not going to put a hotel. Developer agreement. <laughs> uh, how do you do that? Uh, contract and specify exactly what would be allowed on this property. And that would survive any sale, et cetera? Yeah, it would go, run with the land. Um, my one question or concern would be, um, April, I don't know if you can go back to the map where it shows the site, potential site plan. Okay, so how far from, I guess it's the, um, okay, northern border, good, because I'm glad I saw that arrow. Um, how far from the northern edge of the property is where those t trucks would be pulling in? I'm concerned, as the previous commenter mentioned, right. you know, noise and waking up her kid and right. et cetera. So, so, origin, so our, or a map there is that first building. Um, it's a 50-foot building, so it'd be 50 feet south. So there'd be a 50-foot building. So that'd be in close RV storage there. So it's a similar distance from the house to the first drive space uh, as to Lovers Lane, which already has vehicle traffic. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and that and that's as far back as they'll let us, as as far forward as they let us put anything there on the architect work. What kind of fencing do you have there, or would you plan for there? So that north side would be a center block. How high? Um, whatever they require. Um, but it, it would be a six six foot, foot minimum, and, and uh, potentially more. Um, I, I think he was like eight. Eight. So with, with a doesn't require variance on commercial. I don't think. Right. Um. Lighting, but how how where would the lighting be on that north side? So I I, I would imagine it would be on the on that north building on the north border. There would be lights down there with cameras facing to the south. Not facing into the surrounding properties then. No, no, no and, and I you know I'm, we're not horrible people. I, I understand their concerns 100. percent We're just we're just trying to make it profitable that property. We. we we bought it and we really don't know what to do with it now, except for this, <laughs> to be honest. You know, we can't, we can't really farm it. Um, I don't know. The, the well issue, I'm, I'm already dry. The, the water's dry there, the well we have. So it, it would need a new, new well put in. Are there any questions for Mr. Michigan? All right. Um, thank you. Is there anybody else in the audience who would like to comment on this item? Um, we, you had your 
crime. Um, I can't allow additional time unless I gave it to everybody. So I can't at this time. Um, but if there's somebody else in your group who hasn't spoken, they can come up. Okay. Um, is there anybody else who hasn't already commented that would like to come up? No, you're... Uh, we, to, to the chair, we, we've given everybody uh, equal time. Equal time here. We're, yeah. we're... Um, is there anybody on the phone? No, we have nobody on the phone. Okay, we'll run the minute. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Good idea, Matt. Oh, I didn't know it was going to be that loud. There we go. All right. Um, okay, so um, that is going to close the public comment on this item. Um, as Matt, um, as county council, uh, suggested, it'd be a nice idea if you guys talk to each other, because I think that oftentimes where there's lack of knowledge or misunderstandings, that's where problems arise. And maybe if you talk to each other, um, then you might resolve some of that. Um, so we're going to move on to commissioner discussion. I have a couple things that I want to bring up, but I'm going to give you all the floor first, if you'd like. I got it. You got it? I got it. All right. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll make a comment. Go ahead. Okay. Um, once again, this looks like uh, the third third application in three months for a commercial uh, zone or a zone change in commercial uh, for commercial use in uh, ag zone. Uh, it may very well be in the path, but it looks to me, uh, like I said on the others that I oppose, it's a little premature for it. Uh, I don't see any overriding consideration here that would cause me to think that would be reasonable planning, reasonably good planning to plot this out there. There's uh, plenty of commercial available. This was simply in my, according to the applicant, uh, a gut feel that uh, that's going to work there and it may very well work there, but uh, it could probably also, if it's that good a deal, work in a place that's uh, su more suitable for it. So uh, like I, w my, as I oppose the other two that were approved, uh, I'm going to probably oppose this because I, this is just a pr setting a precedent that uh, I don't see we need to be doing at this point in time. I agree with you. On the, um, on the one hand, or is there anybody else before I open up, Steve? Well, the only thing I thought was that if it ever gets to that point, it needs a development agreement for that. I mean, and that's way down the road as far as I. Out of place, <laughs> commercial out in the middle of the ag land is not quite the, the right thing. Wayne or Gil? I'm ready Gil? to vote. So no, hey, vote. my only comment would be uh, yes, it is ag, um, but how are you going to farm five acres? Um, well, if uh, staff could suggest. Uh, continuing this item um, to see what the development agreement would look like and to give the uh, opportunity for the applicant to, 
to discuss with the, the neighbors and, and see if they, they can resolve it. Um, again, this is a, a legislative act. And so, although we are speaking about um, it being an ag land, it seems a lot of the concerns are raised by adjacent neighbors. So maybe that those concerns would go away, um, but it might not change how you vote, but at least uh, it would give us an opportunity to talk to the applicant and present a development agreement to see if that, that changes anything. That would be staff's uh, suggestion to continue with date certain one month from now. I could make that motion if you'd like. It's up to you, Bill. Uh, I'll make the motion that we uh, continue uh, to a time certain uh, item B zone change, PZC, is that correct? Yeah, 21-002. And the time is, what date would that be, Bill? Uh, August 11th. Yeah. August 11th? August 11th. The Whitlatch made the motion. Gil Aguilar was second. Okay, the motion is to continue this item to August 11th, 2021. Um, just for those of you in the audience who spoke up, this doesn't mean that we're going to vote one way or the other if this motion to continue passes. It means that it's a stay for right now, neither here nor there. Um, there will be no further notification, so mark it on your calendar. For August 11th. So um, to vote, uh, we're voting on the continuance only, not on a decision on the requ initial request. Right. Please vote. Okay, so the motion to continue PZC 21-002 to date certain August 11th, 2021 passes with five yes, one no, zero abstentions, and one absence. All right, so that um, we're moving on to item C, which is special use permit number PSP 21-038 and final site plan number 21-003. The contact on this item is David Alexander. We're going to open the public comment with staff presentation. Uh, good morning, Chairman McElroy, Commissioners. I'm David Alexander, Project Planner 2 um, for RMA. For you right now is a categorical exemption and conditional approval of special use permit number PSP 21-038 and final site plan number 21-003 to allow a commercial dog kennel for breeding on approximately a 1,200 square foot portion of a seven and a half acre parcel um, that will include a 120 square foot kennel in the PDFM plan development foothill mobile home zone. This is the vicinity map. The property is located at 37711 Millwood Drive, Woodlake, California, 93286, APN number 055-130-013. These are the aerial and existing zoning maps. Um, there are no current violations on the subject parcel. Um, the subject site is zoned PDFM and the, it contains a residence, a domestic well, a septic system, and um, it will include a kennel and accessory structures. The County Environmental Health Services Division, the County Public Works Engineering Division, the Tulare County Fire Department, Code Enforcement, and the Tulare County Animal Services have responded to a consultation. This is the site plan. Um, entitlement is found in Section 15.10 and the Tulare County Resource Management Agency Policies and Procedures Number 706.1, Zoning Policy Uses in the um, F Foothill Combining Zone Allows Kennels. The commission determined that the term recreation uses to include kennels as a use business with associated facilities. Effective date January 1st, 1998. Also pursuant to section 18.7.B.2.D of ordinance number 352, the zoning ordinance, accessory structures and uses customarily incidental to any of the above uses, um, uses permitted without a site plan review on the F zone residential uses. 
when located on the same lot and not involving um, uh, the conduct of a business, including servants, quarters, in private or storage garage constructed as a part of the main building shall require a site plan review, a uh, final site plan. At the present time, the applicant wishes to breed Great Pyrenees and Wattweilers um, kennels um, by definition of the policy um, 706.1 means any lot or premise which uh, um, can include um, in between five and 25 adult dogs are kept for any length of time by the owner or occupant for commercial purposes including but not limited to breeding, buying, selling, or renting. Um, an adult dog is defined by the Tulare County HHSA animal laws as any dog that is nine months old or older. Um, currently, the owners have uh, three Great Pyrenees and two Wattweilers. Um, this is a retirement um, hobby slash business uh, just for themselves and family that live on the property. A public notice for the project was mailed to surrounding property owners and published in the next year's Sun Gazette with a 10-day public comment period before today's planning commission. No comments were received. The Sun staff report, do you have any questions? How many uh, dogs do they intend to keep? I cannot tell you um, how many they intend to keep beyond breeding. Um, like I said, right now they just have two breeding pairs and um, there's, like I said before, there's no violation um, for this commercial kennel use. Um, this is something that they've planned and so they're going through the motions. They don't know how um, large they would like to do the operation, but as I said before, there is a limit to 25 um, adult animals um, for a commercial dog kennel use. They just have two breeding pairs right now and they're just starting. So I can't say what will come in the future. And general county permits or regulations, what does what do they require for spacing for breeding? In a um, that comes from animal services for the spacing and they have, uh, animal services have been um, communicating uh, with the applicants on um, the proper spacing for the kennels, water, food, and they will be on automatic feeders and automatic watering. No interaction with the people? That's not required? What's that? Not, that's not, it's, I, it they, just, they do, they have interaction. I just wonder who's gonna so, go out and pet these animals and, and not do. make them wild and you know, that oh, kind of thing. As part of the use permit conditions. But. I wish it were. <laughs> no. I, know. I, I just thought some of this language in here is interesting, especially that um, a breeding kennel is a recreational use. It's just could be. Well, it depends what you're recreating, but yeah. Um, are there any questions? Other questions for David? I, I, I've got a question. Um, so we've got a 120 square foot kennel. Uh, we don't have any information on to, like you said, spacing. Uh, we're allowed up to 25 dogs, but that's, uh, uh, there, should, there should be a limit uh, to what is gonna be allowed in a 120 foot kennel. 1,200, right? 1,200. Well, it's a 1,200 square foot. Um, the kennel's 1,200 square yeah, foot. Yeah, the, the, the yard for, the portion that they're using for the dogs to both be indoor and outdoor is 1,200 square feet. Um, the kennel is 120, and that's for, uh, right now, that would be for six dogs. Okay and that would be for kenneling them up for the night. Is, is, is the 1,200 square feet that they got, is that gonna be adequate for 25 dogs? I guess we don't have that information. I'm sorry, the kennel is, um, I missed a zero there. The kennel is uh, 1,200 square feet. It's 20 by 60. Yeah. The, the kennel, kennel is 1,200 square feet. Yes, the kennel itself is 1,200 square feet. Okay. Now. Is that adequate? Because we don't have information, is that ad adequate for 25 dogs? They don't plan on 25 dogs. If they wanted more, if they wanted more space um, for more dogs in the future, um, they would have to do another final site plan because for accessory structures in the PDFM zone. 
Are you sure, David, uh, that we're allowing them up to 25 dogs in there? No, this it's just the, they, they are allowed, but they still are under um, restrictions from Tulare County Animal Services where they have to have a license with them. So but, the, but to David's point, if they, if the Tulare County uh, Animal Services Division found that that was not adequate spacing, the 1,200 feet, we, we are guaranteed that we would either have to modify it or do an amendment to the use permit, but at the very least, it's a site plan. So as this goes back to either building permit and or um, HHSA, and they expanded that, as soon as they do, they have to come in for a, a modification. So, to okay, the, so we do have a means of oversight. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. And there's lot, lots of oversight with, uh, I mean, this is the uh, HHSA. And you remember a few years back, we went through the whole process of updating the, the code on this. So they're, they're, they're looking for the puppy factory. So right. uh, we're much more guaranteed of uh, seeing this again uh, if they need to expand, if it's not adequate. Erin, um, I should know this, but I don't, is um, in an outdoor kennel in the open heat, what kind of air conditioning and all that's required? What uh, is there? <clears throat> well, again, um, you know, it's uh, really subject to environmental health services, the, the kennel ordinance, as far as the, we don't um, necessarily look at that from a zoning perspective. Um, you know, that's more the special, specific regulations of um, the, the regulators themselves and health and human services. So. David, can you point out on the, uh, the property map uh, where this kennel is and which border of the property is it? It says it's on the west side on the... Yeah. Um, where is it on, where, where is that? So it would be back here in between uh, uh, this row of trees and the three trees behind the house. The kennel will be back there. David, do you know the distance then from the kennel to the residences across the creek? Um, on the other side of the Cottonwood Creek, no, I do not know, but those trees are uh, a nice natural sound barrier. Okay. Will they notice? Yes. Everybody within uh, three. Because there's a market on the corner too. Food market or bar or something. I guess it'd be to the Where? south. So, uh, uh, so um, on this uh, hearing notification map, you can see everybody that was noticed. Um, I received no phone calls, no emails, no letters. Used to be a Christian camp too, just to the uh, west. So it's on uh, Highway uh, 45 on your drive. See all those trees? There's a market there. Yeah. So it's right on Cottonwood Creek, huh? Mm -hmm. Behind those trees or in front of those trees? To the east. In deep between. Oh, that's west. Yeah. You're right there, right? So they still have to submit plans to animal services <coughs> and HHSA. Yeah, and they'll go out and inspect the site, um, I think, on an annualized basis. So, yeah. I, I think I asked this when we had that. And I don't know if I'm saying the word right. I never could pronounce it properly. The doc, dachshunds? Dachshunds, yeah. Yeah. Um, when we had that kennel come up, um, I know that there's a set time when an inspection is set for, what, 12 months out? Mm -hmm. But there could be surprise inspections too, right? That is correct. Okay. Any other questions for David or staff? Okay. All right. Thanks, David. Is there anybody in the audience who would like to comment on this item? Anybody on the phone who would like to comment on this item? We have no phone calls. Okay, we'll run the minutes. I turned the volume down, so hopefully it won't beep. <laughs> Nothing's 
helmet to put a clock on there too for you. Could, yeah. That's, that's extra work. <laughs> I like this cool timer because the color changes as it goes around. If you're colorblind. Well, you can see the tonal differences oh. in, in one bigger circle and one smaller circle. So. All right, anybody on the phone, gentlemen? No, we have nobody on the phone. All right, um, then we move on to commissioner discussion of this item. Close up public comment and move on to commissioner discussion. Is there any discussion on this item? You've done a way better job than I ever did. Just a, <laughs> a comment would be uh, the final site plan better be better than that pencil sketch I saw. <laughs> so speaking of, um, we, before this project is approved, we still have to get a final site plan. This is the final site. This is the final site plan. The final site plan is uh, allowing the additional structure of the kennel and the PDFM zone. But the, uh, the site plan itself is the drawing that you presented here today. Yes. No scale. Um, uh, well. I think the drawing's okay. Square feet on uh, what was it, five acres? Um, seven acres. A tiny little spot. <laughs> right. Three hundred. Might, might be your Set copy back, or something. Distance. I'm just. <laughs> who defined recreational use? <laughs> it says the commission, but <clears throat> was that this predecessor group or this group's predecessor? Yeah. Can we undefine it? Um, we can, well, and the, I don't know if that would really change anything because whether you call it commercial or recreational, the PDFM zone would allow the kennel. So the, the only reason we're really here is because the PDFM zone requires use permit, an opportunity for us to review, review the project. Um, otherwise, uh, PDF, and by its nature, allows quite a few, quite a few uses, including industrial. This is a good sized parcel. It's uh, like 650 feet deep. So, so if this is the final map for approval, mm -hmm. the, uh, so the other conditions of approval then, uh, for instance, on page seven, uh, item five, where we're, they have to conform, he has to conform with um, building regulations. And then on page eight, uh, under health services, uh, things like air conditioning for the kennel or proper uh, structure for a kennel, that all will be covered in those sections. Uh, right. <clears throat> right. And I mean, technically, uh, if he was in violation of the kennel permit that could be grounds to revoke it, the land use permit as well. So yes, he has to be in compliance with all these, uh, all the regulations. Okay, um, Aaron, on page seven, um, in item six, it says the planning and development director shall may grant exceptions to this condition upon request by the applicant. So does that mean that whatever we approve today, the you could grant something different? Um, the granting of the exceptions uh, would necessarily need to occur as this is being brought forward. Um, <clears throat> what I would have the power to do is if they do modify the site plan, still they can't exceed the 25 dogs, mm -hmm. but if they modify the site plan to come into compliance with the kennel requirements, we, I, I, the planning director has the right to, to modify uh, 
accept modifications to the site plan. And, and this is just a site plan. It still has to go through the building department. Anything that has electricity, yeah. Yeah. all so, those buildings so will have to have a kennel permit. real plans. You yeah. know. And again, the other regulations are there in place to uh, cover the concerns that you may have about the dogs themselves. Again, it's does, does the zoning allow uh, a kennel? Yes. Um, <clears throat> but again, the PDFM requires a, a use permit in addition to and a site plan so that we, we can see it. That's the uh, PD part of the plan development part of the PDFM. Okay. You know, I think we've got quite a bit of oversight on this. Uh, uh, we've got and code compliance and monitoring and all that kind of stuff. And of course, then the neighbors are going to kind of keep them in line too. So they're going to probably alert anything that comes up. So for what we're doing here today on the site plan and everything, I, th I, I think we're, I'm okay with it. Is that a motion? Uh, well, we're not. Is, she didn't uh, is there any for, further discussion? She didn't ask for it yet. Okay. okay. Is there a motion? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll make a motion here. Let's see. Just getting over bronchitis. I know we closed the public comment, but we did have a late email that came in in opposition. Can I read it into the record? Uh, Matt? Yeah. Um, sure. Okay, one moment. It's from Kirk and Caroline Cramlet. Um, he says, um, we are both opposed to the approval of the special use permit. 1,200 square feet seems quite large for a kennel. Owners have allowed two large breed dogs to roam free, trespassing and barking all night. We have endangered San Joaquin uh, kit fox that have two dents in our adjacent creek that could be thre threatened by. Thank you for the consideration in this matter. Respectfully submitted, Kirk and Caroline Kramlet. Okay. Um, on that note, I, I have a question. Um, is there fencing around the property? Um, that I do not know. No fencing? That I cannot speak of. Okay. Is fencing required, Aaron? Yes. Yes, fencing is required on all our use permits. Okay. Is there any other discussion? Anything else come in, Thoma? No, that was good. All right. Um, so we're moving on to if there's a motion. Try. If I can get it out, I'm just getting over some bronchitis, and I don't run out of air before I get too far down the road. Breathe on Gil. Yeah. Or move it closer. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna move closer. Um, I, I uh, move to uh, approve a categorical exemption consistent with CEQA and state CEQA guidelines pursuant to Title 14, California Code Regulations, Section 15061, Subsection B3 pertaining to common sense rule and conditionally approve special use permit PSB 21-038 and final site plan number PSR 21-003. Bill Whitlatch, I second that motion. Okay, so please vote. Okay, motion to uh, approve this item has passed with five yes, one no, zero abstention, and one absence. Okay, um, we are moving on to item D, which is uh, special use permit number PSP 21-044, and the um, staff member on this is David Alexander. Hello again. And we're opening public comment with staff presentation, so, okay. Right now is a an expanded categorical exemption and conditional approval of special use permit number PSP 21-044 to allow a three megawatt solar array on approximately 20 acres of a 55 acre parcel in the AE40 exclusive agriculture 40 acre minimum zone. This is the vicinity map. The property is located approximately 600 feet northeast of the southwest corner of Avenue 108 and Road 40, approximately 500 feet um, west of um, State Route 43 in Angiola, APN number 291-090-013. These are the aerial and existing zoning maps 
there are no current violations associated with the subject parcel. The project review committee application number PRC 21-018 was approved for the applicant to submit the special use permit application on April 15th, 2021. The parcel is currently vacant. The subject site is not under a Williamson Act, Williamson Act land conservation contract. The County Environmental Health Services Division, the County Public Works Engineering Division, the Tulare County Fire Department, Code Enforcement, Solid Waste, the Environmental Coordinator, Department of Fish and Wildlife, District 4, Regional Water Quality Control Board, District 5, the State Public, the Public Utilities Commission, the Department of Conservation, Edison International, and the Tulare County Farm Bureau, was sent a consultation request on May 26, 2021. This is the site plan. Entitlement is found in section 16 of ordinance number 352. As amended, the zoning ordinance allows the construction and operation of public utility structures um, in the AE40 zone, subject to approval of a special use permit. Tulare County Zoning Ordinance number 352, resolution number uh, 2010-0458 and 2010-0590 included both solar and wind electrical generation facilities under the definition of public, private and public uh, utility structures and resolution number 2010-0590 included agricultural zone districts as a special use requirement. The facility is a three megawatt solar photovoltaic power plant generating electricity for PG&E on a plus or minus 20 acre portion of a vacant parcel. Major components of the solar field include 10,098 10, solar modules mounted on single access trackers, 24 inverters, switch gear, transformers, and other electrical equipment an eight foot tall uh, chain leak fence, fencing uh, with three strand barbed wire um, fencing in the area, the entire area of the 20 acres and a 1000 foot power line to connect to the existing PG&E power line. Construction would include mowing of the site, construction of on-site roads, installation of equipment pads and racking, solar module placement, and electrical connections. Construction would occur over approximately six months. The facility will operate automatically, be remotely monitored, and remain unmanned. Occasional site visits would occur for security, maintenance, and repairs. Uh, vehicles will access the site via um, Avenue 112 to the north, a 20-foot wide gravel or compacted, uh, compacted native earth access road is planned. Unmanned, no water or wa wastewater service is required. No water is used or generated by the um, solar system, uh, the solar, solar photovoltaic system. Tulare County Zoning Ordinance number 352 by Board of Supervisors Resolution number 2010-058 as amended requires a developer agreement that includes a reclamation plan and tax agreement. A reclamation plan is required to return the land to its current or better agricultural condition. To ensure reclamation is performed, financial assurances are required by the developer based upon an engineer's estimate, estimated probable cost of the reclamation. The reclamation plan will incorporate a stormwater pollution prevention plan and dust control measures. The dismantling and removal of all equipment from the site to include recycling and disposal of e-waste site demolition to include the removal of fencing and gravel, and site reclamation to include finishing grade and application of um, compost and seed mixture. The sales tax agreement will require the project location to be considered as the point of sale to maximize the capture of sales and use tax re revenue for Tulare County. A public notice for the project was mailed to surrounding property owners and published in the Extra Sun Gazette with a 10-day public comment period before today's planning commission. No comments were received. The Sun staff report 
Do you have any questions for myself? And I believe um, the applicant should. David, one question I had about the use of water because it's uh, you said that there's not going to be any water needed, if I heard correctly. Um, but on other solar projects, they did something or did a well or planned something to clean the arrays a couple times a year. With what I read was their operational statement, so they do not plan that. If they do any type of cleaning, they would bring in their own water truck as far as their plans as of now. So they're not going to dig a well or? That's not their intent. Okay. Do they already have a uh, power purchase agreement with PG&E? I believe so. Or do they still, or do they have to apply for it? Part of their part of their application of due diligence. Uh, one of the things that helps them with their power purchase agreement is having entitlements with the county. So they can allow them to bring it in the process. Right. That would be my guess. I don't think they put it in without a. Uh, it's pretty expensive to put in without an agreement. Without a what? I mean, they all have to come yeah. together. Right. But if they come in to the power company and they have their entitlements to build from the county. Then uh, they're they're considered. You build it unless they have that agreement. That's right. Yeah, you can never. You can always not build it. <laughs> right. Yeah, they typically um, get the power purchase agreement after after the entitlements, but sometimes they do begin that discussion early. Page eleven, condition eighteen uh, says landscaping shall be installed and maintained on that portion of the project site adjacent to the public right of way. Um, how are they going to water it? They would use native grout resistant, um, like an on the technical term for the mixture that they that they shoot out for seeding. I'm, I'm just asking because it says, uh, you know, particularly something that jumped out that it has to be of sufficient height to shield the project site from public view. That requires a lot of water. You've well, through, through the chair, um, we haven't always required landscaping, uh, but we do require the shielding aspect. Not yeah. every uh, the developers, yeah, they'll, they'll do the slat, and you know, <coughs> especially when you have these um, thousand-acre <laughs> projects, gets a little bit more complicated. But that that is one of our standard conditions to to get them to actually shield it. So landscaping includes slatting and things like that. Basically, we've uh, interpreted it that way, but uh, okay. if they, they do choose to go down this route, uh, water efficient landscaping ordinance and everything else would require them to use drought tolerant plants. Yeah. But again, the intent is uh, to, to cause um, at least a visual uh, blockage of in, into the site. Maria, the reality is I believe the railroad burr tracks are up on a, on a berm I, and from Highway 43, I don't think you're going to be able to see it at all. There's no public right away there. Right. Okay. I don't know the area, so I'm just yeah. wondering. So that, see the rail, see the rail, in fact, you can, on the, on the aerial, there's actually some train cars on the track there. I believe you got a memo for this project. Yeah. Um, the change of the site plan um, to have entry to um, the site from Avenue 112 was because of future high-speed rail right. conflicts. So I, I don't think I'd be able to see it. The other thing is it's it's set back uh, clear to the west side of the lot of the property, and it's going to be a ways. And the other ones of the county I've been to, they're all well secured by chain link fencing and just people steal. I know hard way people steal, but yeah. Solar panels. No, panels, but you steal the panels. Huh? Is there any further discussion on this item? Questions? All right. Um, then we are looking for a motion. We, Did we have? We didn't have public we, comment, huh? We, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. All right. And I had my checklist here, too. Um, so we're going to open public comment on um, this item for PSP 21-044. Is there anybody in the audience who would, or on the phone who would like to comment on this item?
Okay, anybody on the phone, Vilma? Actually do have, um, let me see. He's in place of the applicant. Rafiq Albert on, is on the line for the representative, but says he, um, only if you need him to speak, if you have any questions for him. Who is he again? He's the applicant. The applicant, okay. Any questions? Do you need him to speak? No, I'm, I'm ready to go. No? Okay. Okay. Anybody else? No, that's all we have. Okay, we'll run in a minute. That minute started a long time ago. <laughs> I kind of did. Because of the delay in the voiceover. No one? We have Nick Walsh as, as well, um, only if you need him to speak, though. Who is he? Nick Walsh? I'm not Nick. sure I'm asking. He's the agent. Is he the agent? Yeah, he's with the... Okay. With the applicant. Do you need to hear from Mr. Walsh? No. No? Okay. All right. So the minute has run. Um, it's beeping anyway. I turned the volume down. Um, all right, so then we are moving, closing public comment and moving on to discussion. Is there any discussion on this item? Okay, is there a motion? Jill Aguilar, um, I'd like to make a motion to approve a Categorical exemption consistent with the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, and the state CEQA guidelines pursuant to Title 14, California Code Regulation Section 15303, Class 3, pertaining to a new construction or conversion of existing structures and conditionally approved special use permit number PSP 21 044. A second. Wayne Millie is all second. Steve, push the button. Yep. So, do you want to undo, Steve? Yeah, let me clear out the vote. Not like erase you, but you know, just undo the button. There you go. Okay, so motion was made by Commissioner Aguilar and seconded by Commissioner Millie's. Is that what you intended? Okay. Uh, please vote. Okay, the motion to approve item PSP 21-044 passes with six yes, zero no, zero abstention, and one absence. Uh, we move Madam on. Madam Chair, did we have a senior break? Yes, senior break. Uh, uh, ten minutes? Five minutes? Five. five minutes. Long five minutes.
Ready? You ready? All right. We are continuing now with item which is the final site plan number PSR 21-001 and the staff member on this is David Alexander. Hello again. And we're opening the public comment with staff presentation. Uh, before you right now is a categorical exemption and a conditional approval of final site plan number PSR 21-001 to allow three new billboards, um, approximately 14 feet tall by 40 feet wide with an overall height of 55 feet on a 4.33 acre parcel in the M1 SR light manufacturing site review combining zone. This is the vicinity map. The property is located at 20701 Road 220, Lindsay, California, 93247 at the southeast corner of the intersection of State Route 65 and Avenue 208. APN number 214-090-017. In existing zoning maps, there are no current violations associated with the subject parcel. A project review committee application number PRC 21-016 was approved for the applicant to submit um, for the uh, site review, um, final site plan. On April 15th, 2021, the parcel contains a metal building for uh, metal building manufacturing, two mobile homes, a domestic wells, um, septic systems, and um, accessory structures. The surrounding properties are all zoned AE20, exclusive agriculture, 20 acre minimum zone to the east. Um, these contain active agriculture and scattered rural residences. The County Environmental Health Services Division, the County Public Works Engineering Division, the Tulare County Fire Department and Code Enforcement were all sent a consultation request. This is the site plan. Entitlement is found in section 13.D.8 um, in one Manufacturing zone, outdoor advertising display signs are allowed um, with no requirements. Entitlement is also found in section 16.4.B, SR, site review combining zone. Site plan review required, no, site plan review required. No building or relocation permit shall be issued or special use permit approved, nor shall any grading or construction work be allowed until a final site plan has been reviewed and approved by the Planning Commission. Development standards in the M1 zone allows buildings and structures uh, 75 feet in height at maximum. The applicant um, has provided um, three letters, one for each of the billboards from Caltrans stating the proposed Display location is identified as conforming to the requirements of the Outdoor Advertising Act at this time, um, which allows the applicant to submit an application for a state permit for outdoor advertising. A public notice for the project was mailed to surrounding property owners and published in the Exeter Sun Gazette with a 10-day public comment period before today's planning commission. No comments were received. This ends staff report. Do you have any questions for myself or the applicant who are here today? Um, David, I do have one question, and this might sound dumb, but I, I'm kind of trying to understand the new math or new English of a 14-foot tall billboard with an overall height of 55 feet. Does that mean 40-something feet of legs? Yes. Okay. So the, the overall side of the billboard itself is uh, 14 feet tall by 40 foot wide and then um, with the pole itself, or poles itself, um, it comes out to overall height of 55 feet. Okay, got it. Is this allowed in other zonings like agricultural zonings? With a special use permit. But it isn't allowable use sign? <coughs> um, AE1 or AE? Well, for off-site advertising, that's why um, we're here is because this was zoned uh, M1. Uh, uh, yes. 
Yeah, so it's the, the only reason we're here is uh, BSR um, overlay. Uh, otherwise, it would pretty much be allowed by, right? Or with the, no, just with BSR is the only reason we're here, right? Dave? I thought I knew ADE. So is Highway 65 considered a scenic corridor? No. No. I, I think for over zone, you could have a sign also if you Apply for special use permit. I believe with a special use permit, but as uh, Mr. Buck stated, um, we're here today because of the site review combining zone. Okay. Are there any other questions for David? Okay. Um, thank you. Is there anybody in the audience who would like to comment on this item? Anybody on the phone, Vilma? And we're starting no. the minute. We don't have anybody on the phone. Okay. Um, while we're waiting for this time and the beep will come up, um, what's the difference between an expanded categorical exemption and a categorical exemption? Uh, basically, uh, what we do is uh, add uh, the, the evidence uh, to get to that substantial evidence threshold um, by adding more information with an expanded CADEX, whereas a uh, uh, notice of exemption is the one page we typically put out there. So the, the difference is just the amount of information and the exemption. Thanks. So, that, so one is expanded and one is not. Right. <laughs> I got to be nice. All right. Um, so that, um, it, it, nobody on the phone, Vilma? Okay. So uh, nobody else in the audience who wanted to comment? Um, we're going to go ahead and close the public comment on this item and move on to commissioner discussion, if any. Uh, just a question, just an observation, I guess, not that I'm necessarily against this stuff here, but is it just me or does it seem like three of these 40 foot by 14 foot tall, or actually 55 foot tall on four acres is kind of much? Yes, yeah, I think so. I, I, I drove by it today, so I mean, I took a look. Okay, yeah, they can do that. Is there a height restriction on those things? 75 feet um, really? in, in height is allowed in the M1 zone. Five feet big. That's a long way. There's a picture. So three is a lot. Uh, uh, that's only, it's on four acres, so they've got to be pretty darn close to each other. Well, it's a long, though. It's long because yeah. of the angle. It's, it's really an unusable. Probably about property. 200 yards apart, you know, and I'm going to guess okay. there are going to be three different types of signs, you know, three different advertising. You can well, see the. Well, you drive by there, Steve. I'm gonna. I'm gonna concede to you whatever your thoughts are. What are they entitled to before we change yeah, the rules? Yeah, I have no idea. You know, you know how long I mean, that is. They, they have an agreement with somebody to, to erect them. So, what are the unexpanded conditions? They have. Uh, they, not not only with us, but to put them up, Caltrans is. Um, like I said uh, at the very end, the uh, let me quote the act, which is the Outdoor Advertisement Act. Um, they re they before even coming to us, they started working with Caltrans okay. and got an approval to submit their um, their application for the outdoor advertising under the Outdoor Advertising Act. As right now, the proposal display locations um, as it is identified. It, identified as conforming to the requirements. So I guess that means that the one, and I don't know what street that is, but the one that's northernmost is not blocking the site of the, at the intersection, is not blocking the view? Correct. Okay, because of the tall lakes. Mm -hmm. 
there are some closer together than that on the curve just north of Lindsay as it swings over to uh, Spruce. There's two big casino signs. Those are huge. Does that work? And, and they're like maybe 50 feet or less apart from each other. And there's okay. another one down at uh, the Strathmore, Steve, right? Yeah. It's the packing house. Packing. And I think another one across the road, across uh, 65. Gonna... Not, not yet. But we'll wait to open the public hearing. Well, we closed it already. But because I asked several times. Yeah. And who are you? He's the applicant. He's the applicant. He's the applicant. I'd like to hear him, Madam Chair, if you don't Okay, mind. so, um, yeah. Um, uh, we're going to then reopen the public hearing, um, public comment. So we haven't closed it completely. We're going to reopen the public comment um, and then get back to commissioner discussion. So go ahead and come up. Uh, you'll have three minutes. And anybody else who wants to talk will have that opportunity as well since we reopened it. Um, state your name and address for the record, please. My name is Jeremy. I'm a West Coast Billboards, uh, 1449 C Avenue 228 here in Tulare. Um, Gregory, um, I, some of these questions that you guys have, uh, like I said, I, I do have some other billboards that we're looking uh, to uh, apply for permits are that which are in the, the PD plans. Um, we are regulated by the state uh, Caltrans, as uh, he mentioned, and billboards are required on that express freeway, which is 65. That means that there's uh, usually intersections or stoplights, and then there's freeways, which are 99. Um, Caltrans requires that there are 500 foot separation between billboards on uh, Highway 99. The expressway, which is 65, that we're talking about now, they require a 300 foot setback between billboards. We originally were looking at placing four billboards on this property, which we do have the spacing, but we did think, just, just like uh, you uh, ladies and gentlemen thought they were a little congested or close together. Um, they, Caltrans, once again, does allow a little bit bigger of a size billboard on the 99 or the 65, and uh, we opted for a smaller board there. So there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of scrutiny over billboards, sizing, and spacing. Um, we do like a little more space. It just gives you a little more read time. It allows our advertisers to uh, visu visually see the billboard a little better. Are these static or electronic? They're going to be static. Okay. Do you own the two on the curve, uh, the, the casino? Yeah. I'm familiar with those. Yeah, those are an older board. They're a wood structure. Um, uh, laws have changed over the times and the ordinances have changed. So those were probably, I would say, established maybe in the 60s or, or 70s before they had so many regulations in, on billboards and spacing requirements. It just gets harder. <laughs> okay, any more questions for Jeremy? I'll be back. The same hearing another Next hearing. time all right <laughs> I, like i said i hear these questions like oh I, I want to tell them so bad so i just you know now that's I, why just fyi for the next hearing yeah um, when the public comment opens sure. feel free to speak and we can ask questions to you at that time otherwise we don't know necessarily who you are or sure. why you're here okay yeah but all good all right thank you sure sure yeah, she'll say the applicant's here. So. I've done this a few times, but every time is still like my first time. You know? <laughs> so, all right, thank you guys. Thank you. Is there anybody else in the audience who would like to speak before we close the public comment and final closure? Anybody on the phone, Vilma? No, we have no phone calls. Okay, so the public comment is now closed. And is there any further commissioner discussion? Anybody? Oh. Would would anybody like to make a motion? Oh, there is Aguilar will make that motion to approve a categorical exemption consistent with the California Environmental Quality Act CEQA and the state CEQA guidelines pursuant to Title 14, California Code Regulation, Section 15303, Class 3, pertaining to 
new construction or conversion of small structures and conditionally approved final site plan number PSR 21-001. The second. Please vote. The motion to approve uh, the item PSR 21-001 passes with five yes, one no, zero abstentions, and one absence. Okay. We're going to move on to the continued public hearing, which is for special use permit number PSP 21-007. And just for those present in the audience who might want to comment on this item, um, we had a public hearing last time this item was up and comments this time would be limited to any new information that staff presents. Um, so we're gonna continue with staff presentation who will answer some of the questions that the commission had. Uh, um, tell us why. Can we hear? Yeah. Could we hear? Was that enough? Aaron? Could you? Okay. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, um, I am Aaron Bach. I'm the planning director with the Resource Management Agency, uh, filling in for Sandy, who couldn't be here today. Um, I know you had a few questions about this project and may have had some questions uh, for the applicant. Um, so we made sure at least a representative could be here to answer some of those questions. I do believe they need translation. So Roxana, uh, when, when they do get called forward at the public hearing stage, if you'd be prepared to translate. Um, <clears throat> so um, this is PS, continued hearing for PSP 21-007 um, June, uh, on June 9th, 2021. Um, the overview is that this uh, request um, uh, is to add uh, bovine calves, a third mobile home, and a vehicle salvage yard. And um, the are here by way of a code case. And so they're trying to remedy that by getting this use permit. The project is located at uh, Road 140 uh, in Tulare. And the APN is 196-060-027. Um, the site contains an existing swine operation and the following facilities, 10 corrals, uh, which are 40 by 40, four corrals, which are 30 by 30, seven sheds, 30 feet by 80 feet, two sheds, 30 feet by 600 feet, and two sheds, 30 feet by 50 feet. In addition, the property also contains two mobile homes, two septic tanks, one domestic well, one fuel tank, and two diesel tanks. Um, the properties to the north and south are AE40. Uh, properties to the west are zoned O, recreation, and M1, light manufacturing, um, as well as other AE40 properties, but uh, some of those do contain a dehydrating, dehydrating plant weapons range, dairies, orchards, row crops, and scattered ag. Um, this did come to us through environmental health, and um, at this time there's no cost recovery as they're coming into compliance uh, by pursuing this uh, use permit. Uh, the notification map shows that all properties within 300 feet were notified. And we have not received any complaints to date or concerns. Uh, here's the vicinity map. The APN map. Uh, the aerial photograph showing all the uses. Uh, this project is consistent with the general plan. It's consistent with the zoning with the use permit. There's no Williamson Act on the property. Uh, consultations were sent to all the uh, agencies, including the Regional Water Quality Control Board. <coughs> and uh, even the Regional Water Quality Control Board did not have recommendations. The 
The zoning map showed zoned A40, AE40. And here was the original site plan, and we have an updated site plan for you. Thank you. <laughs> Good job. Um, where you can see where everything's uh, located a little bit better. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, just going to go through the commissioner's comments and how we responded to them. Uh, one is the site plan, which you can see for yourselves. Um, the dimensions of each pin was a, a question. Uh, the 26 acre property has a total of 44 corrals that are located on the property that total 190,000 square feet. Um, the 17 corrals that are proposed to be utilized by 1,300 calves, totaling uh, nearly 70,000 square feet. And the amount of space that is provided in the corrals to be utilized for up to 1,300 calves is uh, also 70,000 square feet. So at full capacity, the amount of corral space per calf is 51.85 square feet. The dimension of the 17 corrals that are proposed to house the 1,300 calves are shown in Exhibit A. And below are two pictures showing existing corrals that are currently located on the property. There's the existing corrals on the property. Uh, <clears throat> provide industry standards for calf hutches. Each facility has its own standards, which are somewhat dependent upon the physical parameters of the facility. Calves are blood tested upon arrival to identify and start treatment of any detected disease or nutritional deficiency. Hutches are generally in the area constructed of wood. Some producers are precast plastic housing with a small fenced space in front. Uh, fresh water is provided in buckets that are cleaned daily. High quality milk, uh, usually pasteurized on site and milk replacer, often supplemented with additional nutrients and minerals. Um, is supplied in the individual, uh, individually sanitized milk bottles at least twice per day. Together, these practices make sure that the calves get the best start possible. The amount of space that is provided for each calf is 2.58 feet by 4.83 feet, 12.47 square feet in the calf hutch. Each hu calf hutch can accommodate three calves. Um, Based on the downloaded uh, dairy care practices from UC Davis um, for calf care from birth to weaning, uh, that was included in your memo, attachment B. The information from UC Davis states that many calf, calves are successfully raised in two feet by four foot, expanded metal or slated wood, elevated pens, individual outside hutches predominate in California. Most are approximately four foot by eight foot wooden hutches, although other materials are used. Hutches can be moved and modified to adjust for temperature, sunlight, predominating winds and direction of inclement weather. Hutches are easy to move or lift for cleaning. Below are pictures showing existing wooden calf hutches that are currently located on the property. As you can see for yourselves. Uh, and then uh, information about the existing uh, swine operation, the previous planning commission agenda item for PSP 21-007 stated that there is an existing swine raising operation, PSP 74-114 on the property that is permitted for 1,200 sows and their offspring. On June 26, 1974, the Planning Commission adopted resolution number 4188, approving a swine raising operation, feedlot, limited to a total of 1,200 sows and their offspring. On July 23, 1975, the Planning Commission adopted resolution number 4453, granting a one year extension of time for that PSP. The existing swine raising operation is in compliance with the Tulare County Zoning Code, which allows feedlots with more than 25 animals in the AE40 zone, uh, subject to the approved use permit. The Tulare County ACFP uh, is silent in relation to swine. Also, the ACFP does not specify how many head, head of animals or how many animal units the facility may have. 
in section 2.4 of the ACFP, the county finds that the applicable regulations and requirements are with the Regional Water Quality Control Board and the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District, neither of whom commented on this project. As administered by such agencies, provided a, providing a stringent and comprehensive regional scheme for regulating the specialized water quality and air quality aspects of confined animal facilities. The county seeks to avoid the imposition of duplicative and overlapping requirements that may conflict with the regulatory authority of such agencies. The number of animals or AUs on a facility are again regulated by the CVRWQCB and the SJVAPCD. Uh, <clears throat> with that, um, that completes the staff's report. Hopefully that answers all the planning commissioner's questions from the first time around. Um, I, I do wish we had the answer for you the first time, but I, again, I, I do believe that memo is uh, concise and yet uh, expansive enough to, to answer any questions you may have had. Aaron, um, I have a question. They, they appear to have a pretty sophisticated digester. Is it covered? Um, the applicants here, if you want to ask them some okay. questions, um, but I'm, I'm sure they'd be happy to, to answer that question. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I wanted to thank staff for the extra information here that, that really provides a, me anyway with uh, enough information to go forward with the decision. Thanks. We can't hear you, Ed. Thanks. He thanks the staff. So. I know. I heard. Um, no, I'm glad for the extra info and the, and the clearer drawings. Um, I wish there were more defined standards because two foot by four foot makes me claustrophobic. And I know I'm not a calf, but I did look up um, the UC Davis, not this particular one, but when UC Davis was mentioned, I looked them up because they're a pretty good standard bearer in this area. Um, and I found, a, and granted it's from 2011, but it's a whole PDF about 75 pages from cattle standards. And based on what I'm reading, looking at approximately 90 feet per expected calf in the calf pens, that's a pretty good amount of space. Yes. Um, if they were going to insist on the two foot by four foot, I might have a more heebie-jeebie problem with that. Um, but that exceeds the UC Davis standards that I found. Um, I hope they keep to that and don't try and crowd more in because the food is, tastes better when it's not scared. Right. I mean, I don't eat cow, but that's what, in general. Um, oh, veal. Veal for baby, I don't, don't want to think about that. Um, yeah. I, well, that doesn't look like 90 feet right there. Mm -hmm. Just for your information, uh, Maria, I, I did talk to a, a good friend at the dairyman, and uh, about specifically about those hutches and the size on the thing. He says uh, uh, it, it's customary, uh, but that they stay in there between 65 and 75 days. Okay. And they're, they're pr proposing 70 days here. So that's well within uh, the standards. standards. And he says, uh, when those calves get in there, there's plenty of room for them. They can turn around and lay down and get up and everything. And, uh, but, you know, and then they, beyond 70 days, they, then they really start to grow and they've got to come out. And that's, that's what. Aaron had a picture of one of the pins with a calf laying down. And, yeah. Uh, so there's so there you go. Well, yeah. That's and, and the truth is, and, the, and they've done this trial and error. This is the uh, the the most humane way to raise these calves because the mortality rates when they're running free, when they're young like this and getting diseases and 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 whatnot is 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 way higher than what's going on right here. And uh, this is certainly a little better standard for them as far as survival. <clears throat> How big are those hutches? Because that's not on the diagram. Yeah, those that hutches. That for the, the fours by eights, looks like. 32 feet? Yeah. yeah. Well, and uh, having gone to UC Davis and walked the campus and seen how they put the uh, calves in the little hutches, yeah. this looks a lot better to me. No kidding. Yeah. Most dairy people I know, uh, they're, they're very concerned about their animals. I mean, they, they watch them closely and treat them well. Now, there might be some that aren't, but uh, it's, it's, it's family to them, right? Right. right. Yeah. 
No, they don't eat beef. They don't eat these beef. are dairy cows. Dairy cows, okay. <laughs> they don't, these are dairy cows. I don't, yeah. So, in fact, they, I think these are all heifers. It's a heifer ranch. Heifer ranch. Yeah, so. What do this, they do with the bulls? They eat them. Those they eat. Very many days. <laughs> So, like I said, the applicant's here to answer any further questions, if you'd like to hear from them. Thanks, Aaron. Appreciate the uh, additional info. Um, would the applicant, who's the applicant? Would you like to comment on? If you guys have any questions, you can clarify. Do you have any questions? No, I mean, what's the staff's input here this time in my discussion with my I just, I mean, I have one or two, if you don't mind coming up and just saying your name and address for the record. Just with anything with animals, I have a lot of questions generally. Okay. So, my name is Ricardo Sevilla. This is my father, Hector Sevilla. Okay. And our address is 2017 Fort, Road 140 in Tulare. Okay. So how big are the smallest calf hutches that you have or that you intend to have? Um, they're all standard size. They're four by eight. Okay. Yeah. They're not the two by four little tiny things? No, that, no. Okay. We have the four by eight. Um, and when do you move them out of there? We do. We shoot for 70 days. We, um, we stop uh, giving them replacement milk at like 55, 60 days, so they transition better into the corrals without the milk. So yeah, we do around 70 days max. Because if you leave them in there longer, they just destroy the hutch, and you'd have to repair the, the wood, and it's <laughs> just not, uh, yeah, yeah. not a good idea to keep them in there longer. So after, after these hutches, they go into a bigger corral with the other? Yes, they okay. go into the bigger corral. Okay, that was my question. Does anybody? Uh, uh, yeah, I've got a yeah. question. Are, are these, is this a heifer ranch, are these all heifers or are these? Yes, we do um, heifers and then we do custom uh, raising for other calf ranches. Right. And those are going to be steers, but they, they get returned back to the, the calf ranches. Okay. Yeah. So, but, so you're raising both sexes then at this time? Yeah, right, right now we have steers and heifers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Is it true that you said your uh, dad treats the cows better than he treats you? Is that <laughs> it's, it's what we have to do in order to make profit off of it because if you start losing calves, then you're not making any, you, you barely make any profit. If you lose animals, you won't be breaking even. So yeah, you got to treat them real nice. Make sure they have clean water, fresh water. Yep. Go out and talk to them. Some of them, some of them you do when you're feeding them, you know, they're real nice and, <laughs> yep. I know from animals in general feel better when when they're treated well yeah and they they last longer you know? i mean when you're feeding them they'll come to you if, if you treat them bad they'll it'll be harder to feed them or harder to treat them when you need to treat them so yeah it just pays off to be to be nice to them and keep them well <laughs> i've toured many dairies and like i said i'm always uh, pleasantly surprised how well you, you treat your animals so i think yeah, you try to do best job to keep them well so they can do their daily games how they're supposed to. Do you have any additional questions? Okay, thank you. Um, was there anybody else in the audience who wanted to comment on this item? Anybody on the phone, Vilma? No, we have no phone calls. Okay, so we'll run the rest of the minute. Oh, Gil's not here to hear that. Okay. Tour to dairy? Yes. Okay. A long time ago. I saw um, one um, uh, in Dinuba, near Dinuba. So the whole milking operation, hay, all that. Pretty amazing. Yeah. It was going through the pipes warm. Yeah. yeah. Nobody? No. All right, so that closes public comment and um, or the continued public comment uh, hearing. Uh, is there any discussion? 
Okay, would somebody like to make a motion? Ms. Plain Millies, I'll make a motion that we approve a categorical exemption consistent with the California Environmental Quality Act CEQA and the state CEQA guidelines pursuant to Title 14, California Code of Regulations, Section 15303, Class 3, pertaining to new construction or conversion of small structures and conditionally approve special use permit number PSP 21-007. Yeah, push a button. Yeah. You want to say? Be, be pushed at me. But are you going to say who you are so that, oh, for I'm the record? Steve Pearson. Okay, so moved by Commissioner Milley, <coughs> seconded by Commissioner Pearson. Please vote. to pass item PSP 21-007 um, passes with five yes, zero no, one abstention, and one absence. Um, and thanks again for all your work on it, or Sandy's work and your presentation, um, everybody's work. All right, um, so we're done with that item. Uh, moving on to the informate number eight, information and discussion items. Item A, it says update on the environmental justice community outreach and background report edits by Nicholas Johnson. Uh, hold on one second here. We're trying to get our, our Zoom working. Yeah, it's working. Mm -hmm. uh, Madam Chair, Commissioners, uh, Aaron Bach, uh, again, um, what we're going to do here is uh, both of our fellows, Civic Sparks fellows, are now working off-site, so we're going to do Zoom presentation with uh, uh, PowerPoint. Um, so are you going to operate the PowerPoint, Velma, or are they, they're going to do They're going to, yeah. Nick, can you share your, there you go. There you go. So, uh, Nick, uh, Barlees, can you hear us? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, All right. Can. All right. Very good. It's, uh, it's your show. <laughs> Good day, Planning Commissioners. Uh, today I'll be offering some updates on a few of my projects completed during my time with RMA. Um, I apologize for not having my camera on, uh, but I want to ensure that I don't cut out or lose connection. So I'll be beginning with the environmental justice element. Uh, currently I'm wrapping up my service here as a Civic Spark Fellow. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Civic Spark, my park, it's a California volunteer organization that branches out of AmeriCorps and is managed by the local government commission. Tulare County is home to many rural communities, 40 of which qualify as disadvantaged per state definition and Kellen virus screen analysis, which takes a look at metrics uh, such as environmental burdens, uh, pollution, income level, poverty, language barriers, proximity to industry and contamination sites, and so on. Uh, so simply put, I had a tall task ahead of me to reach out to all these 40 communities um, to perform our community engagement and environmental justice element. This, this, this young out-of-towner surfer dude who just graduated, moving to Tulare County to lead an effort to talk to 40 different communities during a pandemic, mind you, about the state's largely untested environmental justice element. I was certainly out of my league, and I knew it. So I reassembled this sort of justice league, if you will, consisting of 10 regional environmental justice warriors, collectively called the Tulare County DJ Advisory Committee. The first thing we did together was draft a charter and lay out expectations for the group. Next, centered on the vision and values of our charter, seen in that left graphic, I invited them to partake in a community outreach plan workshop. We used an online program called Concept Board that allows participants to interact collaboratively on a sort of whiteboard in real time. I wanted to make sure I was only facilitating the discussion allowing committee members to actually design what the outreach for the environmental justice would look like. It is my understanding that this strategy of empowering the local non-governmental experts was at the time largely unique to Tulare County RMA. For the workshop, we started with a SWOT analysis seen in the right graphic and listed our current challenges, potential solutions to those challenges and existing strengths to capitalize upon 
for our outreach. Next, we moved into a discussion on the timeline of the outreach campaign, which aligned with my service year and ends in August. Most notable during this, dis this discussion is our effort to project how our outreach might align with the COVID-19 pandemic and the restrictions it created on the more traditional means of public engagement, which would be like attending county fairs and festivals where the community was already gathered in one place. You can see the timeline on the top graphic. And then we took that timeline understanding and infused it into our outreach strategy discussion, where we identified specific things we could do in each of the three phases related to COVID restrictions, virtual, mixed, and in-person to reach those 40 disadvantaged communities. The committee decided that in the virtual phase, we would focus on informing, educating, and building a relationship with, res with residents. In the second outreach phase, we would focus on listening, learning, and collecting data from the communities. And finally, we would analyze data, review documentation, and ask the communities for recommendations on policy and program development. Under each phase, the committee experts listed out strategies for us to implement. The strategies can be seen in the bottom graphic. After the workshop, I distilled all of these strategies and grouped them based on similarity. This process resulted in four groups, which I called task groups, and invited the committee members to volunteer to meet monthly or working group meetings to implement the specific strategies associated with the task group they chose to be a part of. The four task groups are Spanish translation task group, educational webinar task group, survey task group, and a social media task group. Each task group meets at least once a month and provides updates at our full committee <coughs> meetings, which are open to the public. I'll briefly go through each task group and share some of the deliverables. The Spanish task group translates all materials such as the website, educational flyers, and other outreach things into Spanish, which is the primary language spoken throughout our 40 disadvantaged communities. The group also ensures that the concepts and ideas being shared are understandable to the public and people unfamiliar with the planning process and technicalities. The educational webinar task group um, oversaw the creation of an educational video that discusses what EJ is and how the county's element will help its communities. It also hosts a sort of meet and greet slash Q&A um, that we call office hours where residents can join a call anytime and chat EJ once a month with myself and one of the other committee members. Um, the group, the educational webinar group also designed our messaging for community workshops that occurred at least once a month. The survey task group quite literally created the community survey that we have distributed in Spanish and English versions online. Um, and they also designed an online interactive mapping activity, which is being piloted for the first time in RMA with, with a partnership of the IT department. The social media task group manages three social media pages, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter uh, for this project to engage with the public virtually. Uh, this is also a new outreach strategy for RMA. And beyond the task groups, we have partnered with local school districts, community service districts, and other local agencies to, to deliver over 5,000 educational flyers and survey flyers to our district. Uh, we also submitted press releases to a multitude of local media outlets, encouraging the public to participate in our outreach uh, events. Our website hosts educational material and opportunities to get involved both in English and Spanish. We set up English and Spanish hotline as well, um, and also an email address specifically uh, for the project and public inquiries. Uh, regarding the background report, Kitty, the committee gave me general direction to edit the background report to make it more digestible to the general public. I was hoping to have it available for you today, but I'm awaiting for the reviews and edits from our committee. After my service year ends, the committee and county staff will engage in policy and program development discussions, highlighting the data found in the background report, community knowledge and input, and, and uh, in conjunction with the available funding sources made readily available for EJ implementation projects. Uh, that's all I have to present on the environmental justice element. If you have any questions now, I'm happy to take those or defer to Aaron for clarification. Any questions for Nick? Mm -hmm.
It's a lot of, Nick, that's Maria, it's a lot of work you put in, and so I remember being invited to all these meetings, not all of which I could attend, but it um, sounds like you've done a good job. Thank you. Yep, welcome. Okay. Um, I'm good. Well, then, uh, uh, Marlies, did you have a presentation or? Um, yes. I don't know how well you guys can see me, but <laughs> hi. Um, my name is Marlis, and I am another Civics Park fellow. Um, I am working from Sonoma County. I'm not in Tulare, but um, I am stationed with the Department of Water Resources as my project partner, the California Department of Water Resources, and I'm helping pilot some drought legislation uh, with local governments in both Tulare County and Lake County. And um, as part of my project in Tulare County, I teamed up with RMA, Aaron and Nick to help develop a drought risk assessment for their adaptation and resiliency plan. So the adaptation resiliency plan from my understanding is a a project to crosswalk some updates happening across their um, uh, planning documents. So the local hazard mitigation plan is being updated. Um, and then this adaptation resiliency plan will be incorporated into the health and safety element of their general plan update. Um, Aaron, please correct me if I'm wrong on those things, but um, it's, it's a team made up of RMA, and then some stakeholders, including various cities and some tribal representatives and special districts. And also there's gonna be a lot of community input in this, uh, this project, this adaptation resiliency plan project. So there will be um, public meetings held over the next few months over the course of a year, I believe, to um, incorporate any input they may have um, in this planning process. So, um, Part of a phased approach is to assess um, vulnerabilities on different environmental hazards, including wildfire and flooding. And I'm assisting with a drought risk assessment. So um, drought is something that we are all probably aware of. We're in a drought as we speak. Um, the drought affects different communities um, depending on various factors um, in different ways. And so Nick was talking earlier about these 40 disadvantaged communities. Um, those folks like that are more disproportionately affected by um, environmental, like hazardous environmental events like drought. And so the point of highlighting these vulnerabilities is to help prioritize funds or um, projects on for youth decision makers and um, just help recognize where more help may be needed. And so as part of this uh, assessment, I utilized this um, interactive online tool that was developed by the Department of Water Resources. And this is a screenshot of it here um, on the screen. And it's a risk scoring tool. So it takes into account a lot of different factors from the presence of fractured rock, whether, they're, whether or not they're emergency inner ties, risk of wildfire, socioeconomic status, um, an array of factors like that to assign a risk score to a county and then subregions within counties. And so um, uh, this was a very data-driven um, kind of process. Um, and then the next slide, I will discuss how we use some community input as well. So uh, we interviewed a few um, community-based organizations, including Clean uh, Community Water Center, Self-Help Enterprises and Leadership Justice Council for Justice and Accountability. Um, and all these organizations work with local residents in Tulare County and help uh, implement bottled water programs, store water storage tank programs. Um, they advocate for community members, uh, you know, in these, in the kind of local planning level. So from these conversations we had with them, we were able to kind of round out uh, this risk assessment, this drought risk assessment, which primarily used this tool, which relied on a lot of data and you know these factors that I mentioned before. But it's important to also take into account the experiences of folks who live and work in Tulare County, work with residents who are being affected by these issues on the ground every day. 
And so um, uh, some of the topics uh, that we discussed are kind of highlighted in this word cloud. And the bigger the word, that means the more often that word came up in conversation. So things like water quality um, is a big topic of concern, land use barriers, um, reactive versus proactive planning. Um, so this is just kind of a snapshot of what we discussed with these groups. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, Nick, uh, this is a snapshot of the findings that are gonna be discussed in this drought risk assessment. And um, we've just kind of emphasized to here the land subsidence is a big um, concern in Tulare County. Uh, when water is extracted from the ground, from groundwater aquifers, it compacts the ground and the ground sinks. And so of all the places in California, Tulare sees the deepest um, sinking of, of the ground uh, levels um, up to more than three feet, which is pretty severe. And so um, lots of issues with groundwater. Um, there's also just, you know, upcoming temperature changes that are expected to increase. You've probably heard of the number of extreme heat days will probably increase. This is a projection, a um, hundred year projection of the amount of extreme heat days Tulare County is expected to experience and up to 60 days um, a year of extreme like dangerous heat levels is expected over the course of the next century. So under normal um, modeling scenarios, not even extreme scenarios. So um, these are all factors that are important to take into account when we think about uh, planning for hazardous events and which is why we're taking them into account for this drought risk assessment. And like I said, it will all kind of fold into this adaptation and resiliency plan. Um, Aaron, I don't know if you want to expand on that at all, but altogether, this will better equip the county to be eligible for mitigation grants and funding from the state and federal government to continue um, uh, responding to issues and problems that come about as a result of things like drought and wildfire and other hazardous events. So that's the end of my little presentation. Um, and then I think I'll send it back to you, Aaron, if you want to contribute anything or back to Nick, who's going to discuss uh, his can projects we, further. Can we get a copy of this? Uh, yes. Uh, so we will give um, the planning commission uh, both uh, reports, uh, again, one still being reviewed uh, for environmental justice. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll give you a copy of this. I, I, that was a great presentation, Marlies. I, I really didn't want to add too much uh, to this. I, I discussed our adaptation resiliency plan, but it's uh, quite a bit with you, you folks here. But uh, I think the um, it, you'll be able to see something here shortly, as, just from the drought risk perspective. And um, if you'd like, I could also come back with a presentation I gave to the, the stakeholders group. Uh, a few weeks back, but the uh, a couple weeks back, but um, I think as we move through this, I, you might be more interested in seeing some of the reports that that are going to start getting kicked out here for for wildfire and for drought. Um, with that, Nick, uh, there's one more presentation I wanted Nick uh, to deliver to you. Do you have a PowerPoint for the next uh, segment, Nick? Yeah, there you go. I do. All right, one of my other projects was working on the arena housing projection report. Uh, the purpose of this report was to examine the historical trends of housing development growth throughout the unincorporated Tulare County and compare that to the current arena cycle allocations in an effort to suggest future unit mandates will not be met, even though the county has provided regulatory setting for such development to occur. In addition to presenting these sobering findings to TCAG, which is currently in the process of determining new allocations for the next arena cycle, this report will support the housing research being done by self-help enterprises, as well as supplement the housing element update. Some background on the current arena cycle. Uh, we are in the fifth cycle of arena mandates. Uh, uh, hold hold on a second, Nick. Uh, sure. Velma, if you can move. Uh the side uh, names so they could see the actual projections here. Yeah. There you go. Go ahead, Nick. All right. Uh, just wanted to give you guys some background on the current arena cycle. We're currently in the fifth cycle. 
of the mandates, uh, which were allocated to the county of Tulare in 2014, and it ends in 2023. Uh, the cycle requires that by the end of 2023, the unincorporated land of Tulare County must experience a total growth of 7,081 housing units. This total allocation is broken down into four categories based on affordability level. Uh, so housing for very low, low, moderate, and above moderate incomes. As you can see in the top right graphic, almost half of the required units fall into the above moderate category. <coughs> reference to Larry County, uh, to my understanding, has never achieved the arena allocation requirement in the previous four cycles. Some key findings include, uh, as we stand, in order to hit that magic 7,081 unit allocation, to Larry County will need to approve the development of over 2,000 units per year for the remainder, for the remainder of the arena cycle uh, over the next two years. And uh, for reference, again, the most housing units the county has permitted in a single year since 2013 was 269 units in 2015. So as we look at the bottom right graph, you can see uh, the gray line shows what is needed over the next three years to achieve allocation. Um, our expected path based on average growth rates uh, since 2015 is that dark blue line and then an optimistic path um, it does not even get us anywhere close to uh, what we are required to uh, facilitate. If there's any uh, questions or comments on that, I'd be happy to take those now. Is this the county target or is this, does this include the incorporated city? This is just the unincorporated land. Unincorporated. So what happens if we don't meet it? Uh, so far, nothing. Um, honestly, we're obviously uh, not going to meet it. <laughs> well, in the, the way it was originally, uh, do you have anything else, Nick? No. Um, okay. So, um, the, the way it was originally set up, uh, back in the late sixties was the, um, the cog put together the numbers and then the MTC, the, um, transportation group, uh, was supposed to, um, put the uh, uh, planning, uh, roadway network planning out there to accommodate the growth. And if you weren't able to meet your growth because you didn't build enough homes, uh, then you didn't get the money for the roadway plans. And so Caltrans has that 25 year plan that's supposed to coincide with these, uh, uh, the, with the RTP, um, the regional transportation plan, which is supposed to coincide with the arena numbers. Um, mostly, uh, I've seen cities sue each other over not meeting it. Uh, but as far as the, uh, fed or the state coming down and not giving out money, that, that was the last threat we kind of had from Gavin. And instead we're getting a lot more money to do more planning, to figure out how to build more housing. So, uh, n nothing yet. Um, it, <coughs> honestly, uh, at our last, um, arena, meeting a couple of weeks back. Um, we got the numbers from the Department of Finance. Uh, and then we get from the Department of Finance who's really hard to argue with about their numbers. Uh, they get given to us by um, TCAG and TCAG saying we're probably going to have over 9,000 units in our arena for, for next time. So it's uh, Definitely not realistic. We're looking at ways to adjust that, but the, um, as a lot of people like to say, it's just for planning purposes. So uh, the, there's really the consequences um, have not been felt yet, but uh, at the end of the day, they do have the power to, to pull back money. If you show, if you can't show that you can meet that demand, i.e. you don't have enough zoned land we have three times and even more now with all the community plans we've done to actually meet that demand three times for enough for 21,000 units in this county. And, you know, I, I don't think there's any threat of uh, that occurring tomorrow that would actually meet it. Um, again, that's, uh, and this is what we're trying to do with our SB2 grant and everything else to show we don't have enough infrastructure alone to, we just can't meet it. it. But what I'm trying to do here is have Nick show us what it is, the numbers and where we're at, and then 
say why we can't. Um, in my experience, what we, we just lack for development interest. Um, but even when you do have someone like J.R. Horton uh, looking at trying to do something new and different, uh, every CSP tries to do some work with uh, that has a moratorium of sewer or water or both. And even if you can find someplace like Goshen, the, the prices jump up so high so quick, you know, it's just not worthwhile. And farming uh, ag land prices are pretty competitive, you know, where the price points are at. So it's really a, a tough gig to get development moving. And uh, <clears throat> so I, we, we are just trying to make that argument to the state and to TCAG and everybody else through this um, SB2 money we got. And uh, with the help of Nick here and um, our Civic Sparks folks uh, moving forward. Yeah, <clears throat> appreciate uh, Nick and Marlies. They've done a, a great service to this county over the last year. Um, I wanted to move the environmental justice forward a little bit more, but uh, as uh, <coughs> the, uh, Madam Chair has uh, experienced uh, working with that group, mm -hmm. there's a lot of uh, input, and then uh, you get more input, and you start over again, and uh, <laughs> Nick, Nick's uh, definitely uh, seen it all from that that, that group, And uh, but I'm just glad that <coughs> he's been able to help us uh, catch up to this new age of working off of Zoom and multimedia, which we really haven't done that much of before in different Google platforms and <coughs> way beyond stuff uh, I, I can do. So um, we're bringing in two new Civic Sparks folks next year, and uh, and uh, I think uh, we'll just be able to move the notch that much more forward. Um, when we get our uh, final RENA numbers, uh, we will move forward on our housing element, which does have to be completed by 2023. We also have to do the uh, LHMP, the Local Housing Mitigation Plan, uh, by 2023. Um, and we can't have a completed housing element without having an updated um, adaptation and resiliency plan. So 2023 is the, the year we're, we're moving towards. And if you update two sections of your uh, general plan elements, you have to have an environmental justice element. So hopefully it works out beautifully that on this glide path we're on to 2023. And uh, the more help we get from Civic Sparks folks, the less we'll ever have to pay the consultants. So greatly appreciate their help. I thought we might get fired if we didn't meet this. So. What's that? We didn't meet the standard. Right. <clears throat> well, we have the land. This is all market driven, right? As far as the, the, the number of houses built. And it's, it's, it's kind of a bit silly to me for have these arena housing numbers where they are and they know the ca county doesn't control it. Uh, all they can do is have the land available and it's a market driven thing. And mm -hmm. Well, hold your money because of something you can have no control over is right. pointless to me. Right. And we, we have about the equivalent numbers as Visalia. So, but the thing was, um, we developed about half the housing up to when they started the arena process. Um, but after that, you know, it's, you know, 80s, 90s. Uh, through, through nowadays, it's all been in the cities, and that was the intent of the general plan. So we're really getting punished for the amount of homes we built, you know, back in the, the 40s, 50s, and 60s, you know. So it's uh, unfortunate, and then uh, arguing with the Department of Finance is impossible unless you're Beverly Hills, and then you get free, you know, so. <laughs> it's going to be interesting to figure out how we're supposed to build all that if we don't have the infrastructure or the water behind it. We can't. The Sigma and what Marlies is showing us, these uh, in part of the LHMP is doing vulnerability assessment uh, and regional water or DWR has come out with some new tools that they're using right now. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you're talking so many contradictory state policies SB 743 included, you know, yeah. that uh, <clears throat> unless there is, uh, we just gave a presentation yesterday for our, some of our funding to help self-help. I mean, we gave it all to them uh, for uh, PLHA, three and a half million bucks, unless we keep doing these 
grants from the state to fund these projects. But again, uh, self-help's not going to go into a Strathmore or early Mart where, you know, they're getting pushed back from the CFD for water availability or sewer availability. So it's, it's a huge undertaking to, to really get, and, and like you were saying, market-driven development interests on top of everything else. So it, it takes quite a bit of effort just to, to get some of these projects off the ground. Part that uh, I, I don't I don't know how you put this part of it, but I have another company called Sherman and Associates. We just do residential and apartments, and um, we have to qualify people in order to be renters. And we probably turn away 75 percent of the people who apply. The same goes with people buying houses; they uh, they they can't afford it because of the cost or the cost of living that. Builders want to sell them, but if you don't qualify if you, and your building materials go up, when I used to build lots, it would be $45,000 a lot. Now it's closer to fifty two dollars or $55,000 a lot. And uh, so all these things escalate means fewer and fewer qualified people. That doesn't mean they don't have buyers. The fairest one of all is, uh, I think it's called the USDA. It's uh, they supplement people's uh, payments. Right. And uh, these are hardworking people that just need a little bit extra. Uh, I really support that. But that's limited to certain areas. And so, I mean, if you're going to look at a report like this, you've got to say, well, we could probably build that if we could figure out how to help the people make their house payment. And uh, that's, uh, that's a big problem. So. Is it 7,081 units? That's our solarium. That came from where? The state? Uh, the state and then uh, TCAG. Basically, they get one number for the county and then they, they spread it out based on the previous uh, allocation. And, and so it goes up proportionately unless there's some adjustments. Do we, do we know their algorithm on how they figured it out? Yeah. I mean, it, it was. Does it make sense? Pretty much 2,000 more this time. I mean, I took uh, 58 counties times this number. That's 400 and some thousand. I don't know if that's all right. I mean, L.A. County and the, and the uh, counties around the Bay Area are, they probably have a larger number than this, but. It just, it just depends how built out they are, et cetera. Um, the, the original number uh, Jerry Brown put out there when this all started was 100,000 a year. So, yeah, we're probably up to, yeah, 400. About 406,000. That's, that doesn't count then the incorporated targets either. Right. Oh, it's, it's uh, and I don't know what the total allocation was for the state this year, but. but when, you, when you read the National uh, uh, Home Builders Association data, they're saying there's a land shortage and a cost doubling on the raw materials. So we've got inhibitors that they, the builders perceive and that's a different from what we're, uh, what I'm seeing here. So well, not, we have the land, but we don't have the, the natural resources. Right. So the only thing we can do is make the process as easy as possible. Uh, you know, one, one little hiccup in the process anymore with uh, what you're talking about, and that's why I think the the governor is trying to remove a little bit of the nimbyism uh, from the equation. SB 330. The NIMBY, but even still, I, I, you know, good luck, yeah, especially with um, some of these other more political jurisdictions um, and cities. So, um, again, uh, the housing element, adaptation and resiliency, uh, and the LHMP, all these things are good fodder for if we don't have them for. The, the folks who don't want projects to, to hold up, you know, if we're not vertically aligned in our general plan or horizontally aligned with Sigma or any of these other policies, it's just good fodder to, to go to court over. So the more we could put these things in place and streamline our processes, the more likely we are to even keep up with the 269 units, you know, but if we can't, uh, I, I'm sure there's enough uh, folks out there, and, and they, you, you hear the arguments, Sigma and 
uh, everything is mostly Sigma these days. Um, if we can't address that, then it's going to be really tough for any of our SQL do documents to, to not be challenged in the future. Uh, one, one more thing before I, I think it's getting kind of late here. Um, one more thing I did want to mention, we did uh, win the uh, Redwood Ranch case. So uh, that was a SQL case that's been moving through the, the process. Uh, Redwood Ranch was the uh, wedding venue that uh, got sued. Uh, and we did win in uh, court here. Uh, what happened? We won the court, that, that Redwood Ranch, yeah. the uh, wedding venue, got sued for CEQA on the categorical exemption, yeah. and we won, so, on all counts. <laughs> Is that the director's report? Uh, your yes. report, Aaron? Yes. Oh, sorry, I forgot. Um, so, the, the, um, Suggestion is that instead of doing written minutes, um, the board doesn't do written minutes. Uh, anybody can listen to the audio uh, after the fact. Um, so the suggestion on the table is that we don't do that. Don't actually have to go to court every time. Don't need to redo this. Um, so it's kind of a, just a question that we're posing today if you want to discuss that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I listen to them when I can't sleep. I had on that, Erin, um, was because I know that when certain items go to the board, there's a type of minutes or explanation that goes with it. Um, like so-and-so said this, or these were the items brought up. I've seen that before. Yeah. Um, so the staff report would present that, and uh, for the most part, we have Thelma go back and listen and actually write down more uh, de definite minutes. Okay. Uh, that's still going to be part of our, our Well, policy. that's great, Thelma. It's your fault now. <laughs> yes. I'll defend you. Okay. Uh, we'll, uh, uh, it's just a discussion topic today. We'll come back with any formal actions and or uh, next time tell you who's going to do it. Okay. Um, so is, are you done with your report? I am. Okay. Anything from the planning commissioners? Um, You're doing a great job. Thank you. That's not my fault. That's not my fault. Yada, yada, yada. Um, the only other thing that I wanted to bring up under this item um, is that it would be nice to have, when that one item comes back on the 11th, um, to have as far out as we have to go to see what businesses are in the vicinity. Um, and, and it might be more than 100 feet or 500 feet or whatever it is. Um, and then to see um, what the lighting plans for the facility are. Yeah. So. We're talking about the dog kennel? No, the um, storage kennel. Oh, the storage kennel. Yeah. The dog kennel yeah. Well, that's right, we did go through it. All right. So that's I all know. I have. Is that anything else? You know, the city of said, just for your information, mm -hmm. you cannot have any, a light on your property shined into anybody else's property. Yeah. And I don't know what the county rule is, but it's a good rule. Yeah. All right, uh, meeting adjourned.